say the Clemson flag? We actually have a full size flag. Um, sorry. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
you know, most of the people, I think everybody that we nominated has accepted. So, um, and I think everybody knows that uh, we all know who's going to vote. Just a reminder, the education outreach member, Skip Moe, Martin Moe, has uh, been renominated for another term. Uh, conservation and education or environment member, Chris Berg, has been nominated and approved for it. Chris, down there. Yeah, I'll leave. Okay, that's going, Chris. <laughs> so Chris is back up. So Birch Cultural Resources, Corey Malcolm, welcome back. Uh, the alternate for Submerged Cultural Resources, Diana Silva. Where's Diana? Is she here? Oh, there you are. Hi, you. Welcome back. Uh, commercial Fishing, Justin Brulin. And, and Justin and Jeff Kramer, I don't think Jeff's here, is he? So Jeff was the member, and Justin was the alternate, and they switched places. So Justin is now the man. So welcome, Justin. You get the t-shirt. <laughs> and Andy Newman has been reappointed as the designated member for the tourism and just tourism, I guess. Upper Keys tourism. Uh, so we have two new members too. We have an education alternate member uh, replacing the Alex Grilski as Casey Bay. Is Casey here? All right. Okay, that's good. And for tourism, the Upper Keys, the alternate is uh, Lisa Montulia. <coughs> Many of you know Lisa from the History Dive Museum, and I think you kind of been stalking us in these meetings for a while. <laughs> so anyway, uh, this is a great addition. I'm really happy to have Lisa on board. And welcome, and you're the, you're the gal today. So without Andy here, okay. we can nominate him for some things too. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, it's great to have you guys on board, and uh, you, yeah, thanks for everybody for coming back. Also just want to thank uh, Eric. I thought I saw Eric Hanty here. <coughs> Did I see him? So Eric Hanty and um, Alex Grilski have uh, decided not to be to renew and so they passed on into the Netherlands of uh, SAC history. But they they served for a long time. Alex has been on here for I don't know how many years, at least nine or ten. So anyway, uh, it's great to have them that they're not here. If they watch the video. Good job, guys. <laughs> um, try to remember if you can take a time right now and turn your cell phones either off or on vibrate. It will help. Um, we used to make people buy pizza or put twenty dollars in the kitty. Maybe your phone rang. We're not doing that. Um, for anybody that wants to give public comment, there's just going to be one public comment. Uh, for items not on the agenda, that'll be at one thirty after lunch. So we run a little late and. Lunch runs late and it'll be right after lunch. But if you want to make a comment, a public oral comment, you need to fill out one of the cards. There's a, a table right over here and has a sign-up sheet. And you fill the sign-up sheet. There's also a sheet you can fill out with well, the same sheet. Um, and you can put your comments on that. If you just you know, want to write something at the bottom but don't want to speak in public, that's fine. You get those comments. You can also write and send comments in to anybody, you can send them to me, you can send them to Beth, you can send them to Sean, <laughs> and they'll be distributed to the SAC for the SAC members to know. So anyway, you know, we want to hear what you have to say, and you know, you're certainly welcome to say it in public at 1.30. So. Also, at, at, there's at least one action item on the agenda today, and after we discussed it and taken input, we'll have a public comment on that particular item. Be specific to that item, it's not a time to go talking about fishing or something like that. So uh, we'll announce that. That'll be later on this morning, uh, probably after the break. We'll have a discussion on the motion. So uh, that's kind of our new policy to discuss uh, get public comment period before the other decisions made. Um, with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Sean. We can get on with our agenda. Okay, thanks, Ken. Um, I'm really here just to, uh, I'm just going to introduce uh, Russ Dunn. Uh, Russ is uh, here to talk about uh, those um, national recreational fishing policies. Russ is uh, sorry, the national policy advisor for recreational fisheries for, for NOAA. Um, so that's a national level position where Russ uh, goes around the country talking with uh, Recreational fishermen um, and, and Russ, I think it was about two years ago when you were me. Five. Time flies when you're having fun. Uh, yeah. 
Well, it's, uh, it, it, Russ was Russ was brought into that position. I, I, I do remember that uh, to to really highlight recreational fishing uh, as a priority uh, for NOAA, and and Russ has been the driver in in developing the policy and the strategy for recreational fishing uh, around the country, and, and making sure recreational fishing is recognized as a priority for NOAA. Uh, and uh, and so he's here to talk about. Those, that policy, the strategies, and their initiatives. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Russ. All right, thanks, Sean. Ooh. All right, let me know if I'm uh, too loud, too fast, <laughs> too slow. So as Sean said, uh, my name's Russ Dunn, and I'm the National Policy Advisor for Recreational Fisheries. And what that really means is I'm sort of the, the principal liaison between the national rec fishing community, the national associations, etc., cetera, uh, back to NOAA Fisheries. And um, within the agency, my job, so it's sort of a two-tiered effort. There's an external component trying to connect better with the affected regulated constituency, and uh, secondarily to try and be uh, a voice for recreational fisheries within inside the agency, uh, not to the exclusion of any other priority for conservation or commercial fisheries or habitat or anything else, but simply to make sure that their voice is heard at the table. Um, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit of the history uh, about uh, the, the position in just a second of the initiative. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, history of uh, how I ended up here today. Uh, our policy and implementation plan, which we just put out this year, which uh, is the, are the documents I handed out to you all. Uh, there's a few more extras here if people want additional copies or, or additional people come in. Uh, a little bit about some of the work we are really just beginning with National Marine Sanctuaries and uh, some of the things that are on the horizon for us. And if anyone has a small group, if anyone has a question or uh, in the middle, please just raise your hand and interrupt them. So just a quick um, overview of sort of the scope of saltwater recreational fishing in the U.S. So nationally, our most recent estimates from 20, uh, the year 2013 that there are about 11 million anglers who take 70 million, 72 million trips. They spend about $25 billion in aggregate on both durable goods, so boats, rods, etc., as well as uh, on the trips themselves. And when you add in the multipliers, it, it works up to be about $52 billion in sales uh, impacts. So this is, recreational fishing, as you all know, is an important driver at, of the economy at the regional level, the local <coughs> level, the regional level, and uh, the national level. So Florida specifically, what we've got is about just shy of 2 million anglers, uh, taking about 9 million trips, spending about $4.4 .4 billion, and the sales impacts are estimated at $3.9 billion. That sounded a little odd to me that you could have sales impacts lower than your actual expenditures, so I checked with the economists who put it together and they said yes. In fact, it can occur that way. Their explanation was depending on how many imports you have of um, durable goods and things, and imports meaning things that are manufactured potentially, say, in Georgia, purchased there, and brought in. So there, it, it is possible to have lower sales Im impacts and expenditures in a given area. I'm not being an economist. It doesn't make any sense to me. But. <laughs> All right, so what is the Rec Fishing Initiative? Well. In 1996, or sorry, that was a mag, last magazine. Uh, in about six years ago, Dr. Lubchenco, who was the, at the time the administrator of NOAA, recognized that we, NOAA, and NOAA Fisheries had a pretty poor relationship with the rec community. And basically, when we did most of our talking with them in court. So she decided it was time to uh, rectify that situation, that, that we, could, we could manage better if we were, uh, if we did it uh, in partnership as opposed to in conflict. So she established the Recreational Fishing Initiative, Fisheries Initiative, which she put under NOAA Fisheries. And, and basically you can boil it down to this. To, the, our goal is to really establish, first establish, and then maintain a strong partnership with the rec community. So how do you do that? Well, it's sort of as I said, first you have to change the way NOAA Fisheries approaches recreational fisheries. Traditionally, within the agency, as really an artifact, uh, a, a historical artifact of how the agency developed, 
most attention was given to commercial fisheries. There was better data collection. It was a, it was a smaller, e more easily regulated community. That's where the public saw the impact of fishing was at the fish market or the fish docks. And recreational fishing was really more of an afterthought. So what part of this initiative is, is to make sure that it, co it goes from a, from a water cooler conversation, an afterthought in regulatory action, to uh, a part and parcel of everyday thinking in, in our decisions across the agency. Second, you have to get out there and engage the community and earn their trust back. Uh, there was a, a lot of mistrust had been generated because, frankly, a lot of lip service had been given to addressing recreational issues. Plans would be made and then not executed. And so they had learned uh, to distrust us. So how do you change the way we think? How do you, how do you change the way a, a giant institution focuses on something? Well, it all comes down to, well, first, first you hire the people to develop a process and a plan. So they created this position that I have. We then created a series of regional wreck fishing experts around the country. So we have folks in each of the regional offices and each of our science centers all around the country who focus on recreational fisheries, either in whole or in large part, and raise those issues to their uh, regional leadership in this sort of same capacity that I do at the national level. Uh-oh. There we go. Um, you then develop a plan. So all large institutions, be they corporate, be they government, live on plans, strategic planning. So what we had to do is develop a plan. So the first thing we did is reach out to the rec community, find what their priorities and concerns were in 2010. We held a national summit that had about 100 leaders from around the country, literally from Maine to Guam, brought them in, had them air their grievances, and tell us, what are your priorities uh, in, in, the, in the near future? We then took that and we put together what we call the national and regional action agendas. And the regional folks did the same thing at the regional level. So we had a series of plans. And so if you develop the plan, and work the plan, you can then ch make change in a large institutional setting. So I've just pulled there, we, we literally have dozens of examples of, of uh, progress, I'll call it, instead of successes. Uh, a recent one that occurred in, in 2015, which was really a truly significant marker of how the institutional orientation or thinking uh, of NOAA has shifted is the SK grant. So Salt, Salt and Stahl Kennedy, uh, referred to as SK, has <coughs> traditionally since the 50s been a program focused on uh, promoting commercial fisheries. We worked with that program to expand it to allow incorporation of recreational priorities into that program and the first year out uh, with grant proposals managed to identify about $2 million worth of grants on recreational priorities. A lot of it centered on um, release mortality, barotrauma issues, things like that. Uh, and so it was a real true marker of here's this dedicated commercial program for the last 50 years, and now it has been broadened. It hasn't diminished the commercial component, it just simply broadened the scope of the program. So second, you have to get out there and engage the fishing community. So like I said, the first thing we did when I started this was to host this national summit where we had an airing of grievances and an identification of priorities. Well, from that, we had this first plan we called the action agenda. Uh, we had about just shy of 60, about 58, I think it was, commitments, uh, hard agency commitments we put in there we, when we got to about 95% completion, uh, we realized it was time to host another summit, to check back in four years later, and, and see where we needed course correction, see what, how priorities had shifted, see what new projects and commitments we could identify. So we did that in uh, spring of 2014 and developed essentially the basis for the, the, uh, the policy and uh, the implementation plan, which I'll touch on in a second. 
Uh, we've also gotten out there in terms of just engaging the community. We've gotten out there and done series of, of regional listening sessions all around the country. We have done some innovative things to try and better understand what the, the recreational fishing community uh, is interested in, what their perspective is on how they're managed, on their on the different management tools. So what we did is we we executed a, a national angler perspectives and attitudes survey in 2014, which was really the first time uh, this sort of larger social science uh, uh, was a pro a applied to the recreational community. We, uh, we got out there and one of the things that was brought to our attention uh, right off the bat was concern, particularly from the West Coast, uh, but now it is really spread across the country, concern over barotrauma and release mortality. So we responded by turning around, hosting a national science <coughs> workshop, uh, and what we realized on that, with full of constituents uh, and scientists, and what we realized was this is really an issue that needs to be handled on a regional basis as opposed to a, an overarching national um, uh, effort. So we then uh, established a series or held a series of regional workshops which has resulted in both uh, a set of best practices, recommendations, as well as NOAA has just put out its draft uh, science strategy for release mortality, for addressing release mortality. So, just to, to so touch on the policy and implementation plan. So as I said, large institutions live on policy and, and strategic plans. So after four years of, of making uh, noticeable <coughs> progress, we thought we need to really try and lock this in and continue the momentum. And so while we were at the second um, of the national summits in 2014, the participants there really expressed interest in having a national policy developed. Uh, and that was in response to a, a report that they had done on their own called the Morris Steel uh, Commission report. And so there at the summit when that issue was raised and we saw that there was considerable interest, we committed right then and there to develop a national policy that would really codify more or less our approach to, uh, to recreational fisheries, how we think about it. So, what does it say? Well, in short, it says that we are there to foster, support, and enhance sustainable recreational fisheries for the benefit of the nation. Fairly innocuous, fairly um, straightforward. So, what we did is we developed the policy statement. We then established uh, three goals supporting the policy statement. It basically says support and maintain recreational fisheries resources, uh, because if you don't have healthy resources, you don't have a uh, fishery. Uh, promote saltwater rec fishing for the benefit of the nation. Uh, that is completely in line with the uh, uh, purposes of the Magnuson Act, which says to promote uh, commercial and recreational fishing for the benefit of the nation. And third, we, don't want, we didn't want to have this become a short-term effort. We didn't want rec fishing to be great for a few years and then turn back to overfishing of, of recent years. Uh, and so we, we decided that, that the last should really be to enable enduring participation <coughs> through science-based conservation and management. The way we came up with all of this, and what you'll see in a second, <coughs> guiding principles is, we held about 34 public hearings across the country uh, over the summer of 2014. So from the June 6th to October 6th, we held 34 meetings and public listening sessions where we just said, what would you like to see in this sort of uh, project? So we then just thought it was appropriate to support those, guide, those, um, those goals with what we call the guiding principles. And there are six guiding principles you'll see which are really directly relatable to the three goals. Uh, they are the ones in um, italics here. And what I've done here is just show, just randomly pulled two examples of, of the kinds of projects which would support the guiding principles. And so we developed the, the implementation plan. We had the policy, the goals, and the guiding principles. We took the guiding principles and turned that into a, an implementation plan. 
We said, here are the six guiding principles. What are the projects that NOAA can commit to under each one of those sort of categories, under those guiding principles, that would really reinforce that and support? So it's things like for ecosystem conservation and management, it's things like essentially trying to improve release survival techniques and techniques and best practices. It's enhancing public aid, uh, education, understanding, trying to address invasive species. Uh, promoting public access, obviously <laughs> recreational fishing is all about access to the resource, and getting out there, the opportunity to go fishing. You, to do that, you've got to have allocation, you've got to have quota. That obviously is an extremely contentious issue, so we do it carefully and slowly through the council process. Uh, but it's, a, it's an issue which we have continued to push on for a number of years. Um, we also uh, have teamed up with the sanctuaries, a national program, to try, um, one of the things we're working on is trying to uh, figure out where we can highlight uh, recreational fishing opportunities in a way that's consistent with the um, uh, purposes of the sanctuaries. Uh, coordinate with state and federal management entities. One of the things we heard regularly throughout those 34 public hearings was, hey, we like the way states do things better than we like the way you know of do things. So be more like them. Figure out how to work with them more. So we, we sat down with the commission, some of the states, and said, what, what, what are the sort of things that we can work on? Well, often it came back to education. A lot of times when anglers are uh, caught violating the regs, we hear, I didn't know. I didn't know I needed a permit. I didn't know there was a slot limit. I didn't know. So if we can get out there, we can improve conservation. We can improve their understanding of why the regs are important to improve con uh, for conservation. Another thing is our federal uh, sister federal agencies uh, there's a lot that can be done there. So we have really started to ramp up our coordination with the uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife, at least at the national level. Uh, we've shared some booths with them in the last year. Uh, I was just out with them at their one of their advisory committee meetings, sort of briefing them on this general uh, presentation, uh, explaining what it is we're doing. Uh, that, that's their sport fishing and boating partnership. Uh, uh, solving science and management challenges. One of the things that the agency really can and should do is is, is be a catalyst for and um, uh, help advance solutions to complex problems. So one of the things we're working on is a BLAST model, which is the Bioeconomic Length Structured Angular Simulation Tool. Basically what that is, is a very complex model where you can put in inputs uh, of different regulations and, and, the pop, and the stock assessment and see how it's going to affect fishing pressure, how it's going to affect uh, sales, how it's going to affect the uh, stock itself. And it's, it's trying to uh, advance management and really. Uh, it's, it's sort of the next big thing in modeling for fisheries management. Uh, other, other activities which the agency uh, really uh, is leading on is, is acoustic tagging. For example, out west, there are a lot of areas of uh, high relief where we can't get in and either do trawl surveys or longline surveys because of currents. And they've gotten to the point where they can, for a number of species, just from the uh, returns from the sonar, identify what species it is. And as they get, as that is refined, that'll be brought into the assessment uh, process. Now, obviously, that's not specific to recreational fisheries. That's a larger uh, NOAA fisheries science uh, activity. Uh, providing scientifically sound and trusted information. So one of the things we have found is that there's often a lot of skepticism around the uh, information and data that uh, is used in fisheries management particularly around what we call MRIP, our Marine Recreational Information Program. That's the catch effort and, and uh, landings data collection system for recreational fisheries. Um, we felt that there was sufficient concern, skepticism out there uh, that to resolve it, probably the best approach would be to return to the National, National Research Council and have them do a full transparent uh, peer review of the system. So we turned to them uh, this year 
We, uh, and they have now initiated, fully independent of NOAA, uh, a review of MRIF. Does it work? Is it meeting its mandates? Um, are there improvements that should be made? Uh, and we expect the results, I think, uh, in roughly a year. It's going to take them to, to review. Uh, uh, other areas of uh, improved information, we have just committed to developing a, our, our, our economists to develop a new a strategic plan to help guide our socioeconomic research on wreckfish. What we found is that a lot of our science centers and regions, when working on socioeconomic analysis, either didn't have certain information that they really needed or didn't know what another uh, center was doing in terms of research, so they couldn't take advantage of the techniques that had been, had been learned. So we sat back after some internal conversations and said, how do we coordinate this? Let's make sure that there's a, there's a national uh, plan that we, we can take the time to develop a thoughtful approach to what is the data we need, how are we going to get it. And finally, communicate and engage with the, with the public. That is just an ongoing effort. It involves activities like this. It involves phone calls on a daily basis. Uh, it involves getting out to uh, fishing and boating shows uh, and just really trying to make sure uh, taking a page from the NIMPS um, Sanctuary's book uh, that there are no surprises that uh, come forward. So, let me stop there before I jump into this and see if there's any questions. That... All right, seeing none. So, as I mentioned, uh, uh, NIMPS and Wreckfish in particular and Sanctuaries have been trying to develop a um, a closer working relationship. There's historically been a fair amount of tension between sanctuaries and fisheries uh, <laughs> because we really have almost fundamentally different uh, missions and so there has been a lot of uh, push and pull. What we've tried to do is bridge that gap and identify where, where can we work together to strengthen this relationship. We all have the fundamental goal of wanting to be able to um, take advantage of the res natural resources out there to the greatest for the greatest benefit of the nation, whether that's preserving it, whether that's using it for fishing, or whatnot. So, uh, so my office uh, and the uh, national office now, John Armour, as of late, have been working fairly closely. Uh, we we asked them to take a look at the policy and the implementation plan as they were uh, in development. And which they uh, fortunately did, and they identified a number of projects which they felt that they could commit to, which we brought into uh, our, our plan. So it isn't just a, a NIMS document. It, it is now a larger NIMS NOS uh, series of commitments. So it's, the, it's a lot of public education, uh, again, on invasive species, on fishing opportunities, uh, work, it's some science working together, I believe, up in Gray's Reef. Uh, we're working on an acoustic uh, tagging study on site fidelity, excuse me, and uh, trying to expand participation in the sanctuary management uh, process of, of English. Things like, so they'll contact us, let us know in advance when there are openings on a, on a, on a SAC, and we'll reach out to the rec community and say, hey guys, are you aware of this? If you're interested, nominate yourself. In the past, that happened to, a, a, to less of a, a, of a degree. Uh, we brought John Armour and uh, Vernon Smith, who's the national communications guy for sanctuaries, uh, out and asked, had them participate in our sort of annual wreckfish meeting where I bring all together all of our folks from around the country, all of our wreckfish uh, uh, coordinators that I mentioned who are in the regional offices or the centers. John and Vernon contributed um, throughout that meeting, gave us a lot of good feedback on, on how it could work better on how we could work with the sanctuaries. Um, we're working together on communications issues for constituents. For example, we worked with the National Office on a report that came out this year on the economic benefit of recreational fisheries uh, uh, in sanctuaries on the West Coast, uh, as well as some of their press releases, communications. We just do a lot more back and forth so that there's no surprises, so that we don't have messaging which may one group may think is fine, but is actually setting off a lot of alarm bells for one of the other groups. Yeah? Chris, as a 
beginning of the slide, you said that the missions of the National Marine Fisheries Service with regard to this and the Sanctuary Program yeah. are, you didn't say in conflict, but you said they are, there's tension. Yeah. Um, and then you went on to describe how you're trying to alleviate that. That's a, I guess it's a really loaded statement. Could you unpack that a little bit and explain yeah, well, how, they, so how they are in tension? At, it, at its most, um, to boil it down most simply, so there is a significant, in many of the sanctuaries, there is a very significant uh, focus on conservation slash preservation rather than um, utilization of the resource in terms of an extractive approach. Uh, to, the, to, the, to the extent in some cases where uh, many of the communities see it as going too far. Obviously, fisheries focuses on, uh, no fisheries focuses on sustainable fisheries, but it's on, on executing those fisheries, allow those fisheries in a way uh, which allows for uh, healthy natural resources. So there's a balance often between NOAA being seen as trying to open, or sorry, NOAA fisheries being seen as trying to open everything up and, and let too much fishing activity occur, either in sanctuaries or outside, and the sanctuaries trying to hunker down too tightly uh, and, and exclude all uh, any extractive use or um, uh, or use of the resource, which you know has well, well, I'll leave it there. So that's that's the tension that has existed, and uh, I think it is beginning to ease. I think there's some middle ground um, being found where I think a lot of it was more frankly due to the the language that was used in the conversation as opposed to trying to find it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to say a couple things. My name is Billy yeah. Cosby, yeah. and I'm Southeast Regional Director, Russ, and I, I think we've met before, but yeah. um, on my Southeast Regional team, I, I actually have a fisheries biologist, that George Sedbury, I think, yep. you know, George. But um, I have to, I want to correct, Chris asked a great question, because I, I would like to see it unpacked and unloaded, because we have been working to lessen any kind of, uh, of tension or adversarial yep. approaches. But I, I see we both manage uh, very much the same way, whereas you're using Magnus and Stevens, right. and we're using the Sanctuary Act. Right. Uh, we have a much broader uh, cast and look at, at fishing and all the activities than under Magnus and Stevens, which is more focused on the right. fisheries and the fishing that has fisheries management plan. So it, it's considerably more focused. Right. We manage for continued compatible uses in national sanctuaries. We don't man manage. Yes, there is a, an element of protection and conservation, but so it's in, just like it is in Magnuson. So we, you manage for sustainable, maximal sustainable yield. We manage for mm -hmm. continued compatible multiple uses. Right. So, having said that, um, I, I would say we're, we're coming becoming more similar, mm -hmm. and, and we're, we're, we are. These discussions are helping enormously, and you coming out like this helps enormously because. There is a certain stigma that in some sanctuaries we are uh, uh, more restrictive than yeah. others. Right. Now I want to say that this uh, again, when you're talking about sanctuaries, most of our the, the majority of our 13 national marine sanctuaries and one national marine monument don't have any regulations that affect fish. I would say there's just a few: Stellwagen, uh, Razor Reef, uh, Florida Keys. Flower gardens, but most of those are not uh, don't affect fishing activity. Sean, you can help me on the West Coast. I don't think there are any Channel Islands. Yeah. Channel Islands. Yeah. Channel Islands. Yeah. So I, you know, again, I think um, I appreciate what you're doing to help bring our the thinking together and, and more focus because we do have different congressional mandates sure. that are huge, and the better we can work together on these, the, 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 the smoother things will go. Yeah, agree. I agree. I don't think we said anything that is uh, in conflict there. I mean, I think, you know, is this one? Yeah. Uh, I think they are. I think our focus is, is coming uh, uh, closer together, and I think the relationship is getting better. Uh, and uh, I, it is through, frankly, just dialogue. I mean, a lot of the 
tension that I had seen in Washington, frankly, was just the result of of language being used that what that each agency, uh, uh, fisheries and sanctuaries, used regularly with their constituencies. But those two constituencies saw that language as inflammatory in some way, uh, and so finding a way either explaining what those terms really mean or finding another word which conveys the same thing, I think, has already reduced a lot of that conflict, uh, which we saw just in sort of messaging documents, which was really inadvertent. And, and Ross, I can I yeah. also add that, you know, there's, there's often tension between laws, and, and you, you know, there's, uh, you could say there's tension between the Magnus and Stevens Act and sure. the Endangered Species Act. Oh, absolutely. Or the Rain Mammal Protection Act, yes. which you guys have to address. And, no issues as well. Yeah, yes. a, a lot of that just does come out of dialogue. But they, often it's two different mandates that came yep. from Congress. That's um, right. And and they leave it to the agency to sort it out um, amongst the different. <coughs> yeah, that's exactly right. There's tension. Right? NOAA Fisheries has tension <coughs> internally between its different. The e, as Sean said, the ESA, the uh, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and Magnuson. There's, there are substantially different approaches you can take to implement all those three, all three of those, and we have to figure out how to thread the needle between. So, all right, uh, let's see. I think, frankly, we are just about at the end here. So, what do I see coming up? Well, uh, right now, all of our regional offices and science centers are working on a new set of their regional uh, recreational fisheries implementation plans. Those are expected to be out in early 16. <coughs> Um, so, for example, we have, we have uh, two regional coordinators in our, uh, uh, three in our southeast region. One, a lot of you probably know, Sean Meehan, uh, who used to work for the sanctuary. Uh, Kima Mandola and a guy named Ken Brennan, who's at our science center. Uh, so they are developing that right now. And that will be a series of commitments supporting those guiding principles that the, that the southeast region will uh, execute over the next two years. Uh, we are working on, at the national level, a, an artificial reef workshop. Uh, we're hosting jointly with the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. We brought in the Gulf States Commission and folks from all around the country on a steering committee. Uh, basically, we're trying to look at artificial reefs in the context of fisheries management. Traditionally, within fisheries, they are looked at really only as a restoration tool. Uh, what we're trying to look at is do we know enough now to apply artificial reefs as a fisheries management tool? And if we do, great. Where? If we don't, is there, is there a, 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 are there questions that need to be answered? How can we answer those questions? And then, uh, or, or, or the workshop could determine, you know what? We don't. It's a, it's a terrible idea. We should never use them as a tool. We don't know what the result will be. So that should be interesting. That'll be, that's, we're expecting to host that in June. And then in 2017, uh, we'll get a detailed status update on um, the latest national implementation plan. There's about 65 commitments that the agency has made uh, under that plan, and we'll be providing updates on how well we've been implementing that, or are there substantial changes that need to be made? Some things may be irrelevant at, you know, as we get down the road, we may have made a mistake and Project X shouldn't have been in there in the first place. We may find that we really need to add a whole different set of uh, or additional um, projects. So we'll be, in 17, we'll be two years into a four-year plan and um, give us an opportunity to, to uh, course correct. I think that's it. So with that, I'll stop and open it up, and um, you can either get me now or on the side. Yeah. And, uh, Russ, one thing we kind of skipped over was the, yeah. the, the idea of bringing together all the rec fishing oh, right. uh, representatives. That's right. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so this, this bottom bullet here. So one of the things that John Armour and I have been talking about uh, is the idea of trying to bring together the recreational fishing reps from all of the SACs, from all the sanctuaries around the country. That'll give uh, both sanctuaries and fisheries really a, a, a way to take a, a temperature and a point in time of are there issues, sort of collective issues, that this, uh, the folks uh, in your position see with regard to rec fishing uh, that can be addressed uh, or see issues that are coming down the road at them. 
So nothing has been locked in uh, at this point. John and I are talking about you know, timing and whatnot. And I'm sure it'll involve all the managers. Uh, I would that would be a must. Uh, and um, so I'm pretty excited about this idea of being able to get everyone together in one place because it gives both of us, both programs uh, an ability to say, to take the temperature of the wreck fishing community on the, on the sacks. No, I, I just want to make sure we pop yeah, that one and then um, for, for Jack and Bruce, you know, or, uh, uh, those, these are wreck fishing representatives, but also uh, we, we have other representatives for charter sport fishing, charter flats fishing, yeah, yeah okay. you know. And I, I wrap all that in together when yeah. I see it. And so I think you have a lot of interest uh, from the members of the advisory council. And I think, as, as I told you before, I think everyone in this room has a fishing pole that probably considers themselves a right. Hi, right. Jerry Ellis, Key Colony Beach. Have you thought about the entertaining fishing boating club organizations uh, here in the Keys as part of that? Uh, to receive input from those folks because they're these are folks that are out there fishing in our waters and they understand what they're doing and uh, would like to have input actually. Be in um, that meeting specifically? <coughs> yes. Well, I think the way it would work just because of, frankly, logistics is that we would ask, and I don't want to speak for sanctuaries, but ask uh, you all to speak to your rep, your rec fishing reps uh, here on the SAC and then bring them together it could because otherwise the group would become frankly pretty unwieldy if we brought all the clubs in from all around the country all at one time we'd have i, I don't mean that, that. i mean oh. a representative from a club a club could, could select a representative and say yeah. this is the person yeah. i want to go and represent our part of the case, right for example uh but you know we have it we haven't worked out any of the details yet. We just have agreed in principle, hey, this is a good idea, let's do it. So, uh, so well, please keep that in mind we'll because in our community, we have a very strong fishing boating club. And they are eager <laughs> yeah. to have input into this kind of discussion. Right? So if you could work that into it, it would be very helpful. Right. Also, uh, with uh, artificial reefs, I just want to say that in Alabama, yeah. you can actually purchase your own artificial reef yes. uh, made of concrete. They will take it out to a coordinate that you give them, yes. and put it in water, and you now have your own personal artificial. And I fish them yeah. in, in Ar out of Orange Beach. Yeah. And some of the finest fishing you'll ever find anywhere in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very successful Thanks. program there. You might want to have yeah, they, that, that's a, a fairly unique um, state management approach. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but it works. Um, any other SAC comments? Bill, I'd like to let you have a try to stay on topic, but uh, Bill Wickers is one of our charter fishermen that's uh, been involved in this process. I don't usually let public comment, but uh, I can I wait to the public. I'd like to hear what you have to say, Bill. No, uh, uh, my, I was my, my, uh, my excuse me. <clears throat> Um, I was very uh, pleased with your presentation. I didn't even know that uh, you all were trying to work out these tensions because we definitely had some tensions here and the Keys were still trying to work them out. Uh, the position of the U.S. Charter Boat Association uh, has been, and, and been endorsed by you know, different groups, but was the, the, uh, the, the the tension that was brought to light and we're trying to work it out as we proceed uh, is that the sanctuary had uh, mandate really didn't allow them to get into what we would call fishery management that we have fishery management councils uh, south of uh, the south atlantic council the gulf council fish and wildlife uh, and their mandate was different than the fishery councils Councils have extremely large staffs to decide the, uh, whether the stock is healthy or not. Um, if spawning areas need to be closed, and um, uh, bag limit, size limit, they get all the different tools to keep a healthy fishery and it still allow fishing communities not to just wither and die from too much regulation. 
And that's where we had a disagreement was that we thought that the sanctuary was overgoing their mandate in trying to get into fishery management. Um, and hopefully through this process, uh, we will reach a point where what you're saying is uh, education and pension relief, that we can work something out that we can all be happy campers. <laughs> But anyway, I was really glad to hear this, that you all are working on this, because uh, it, it's, it's been a, a, an ongoing discussion here, uh, even to the point of bringing in lawyers and all. So uh, hopefully we're past the lawyer stage. Thank you. We're never past the lawyer stage. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, Bill, I'd like to address this, because like, we keep hearing it. You and I have had a lot of beers trying to discuss this point. <laughs> And, and you keep saying it, and it's not accurate. And I, I want to clear the record once and for all, and maybe it won't end here, but I'm going to say it yet again for this record. And that is, National Marine Sanctuaries don't manage fisheries. However, our regulations fully allow us to implement regulations that affect fishing. Our very first National Marine Sanctuary here in the Florida Keys, the Key Largo National Marine Sanctuary, had no wire fish trapping, no trawling, no spear fishing, no tropical fish collecting, no, all of these activities were prohibited in the Key Largo Sanctuary in 1975. Lou Key had many of the same regulations. There's nothing in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and Protection Act that has a mandate that we can't affect fishing. Now, by the way our, our regulations are set up under the National Marine Sanctuary Act, we, we can and do affect fishing, but if we do, we have to go to the councils and work with the councils and give them the first opportunity to create a regulation that we wish to implement. Now, if that regulation doesn't go far enough, if we want to do more, say, protect the habitat, then we can appeal it and it, and it gets kicked up a level above to be decided at another level. But within you all have been listening to one attorney way too long on that issue. <laughs> And he fist pounds and says it all the time, and it's very inaccurate. Now, that's, I, I can't, I'll just stop there because I'm starting to feel my blood pressure. <laughs> Billy, you know I don't want to get your blood pressure up. <laughs> I'll buy you another beer, man. If it takes another no, case at the bar, I'll No, <laughs> this is, I guess, serving on this board for six years and going through that before, but um, I guess the one thing that really, uh, it was more of a protective thing for me. I when when I saw what you know what created the problem uh, with all those uh, lines on map and constant thing about closures of this because of fishery this and fishery that. Um, I said, oh, here we go again. Yeah. And um, it, from a protective standpoint, I swear I do not understand with the fishery management councils in effect. Constantly, that's like with the mutton snapper, they just came up every you know, they're having an 80 percent drop, which is fine, we, we think that's fine. But what I'm just saying is, why does the sanctuary need to get into an area that, that brings a lot of you know, local tension, like he's talking about, when you really don't need to, when you've got the other groups to pick the heat? Let, let, let me answer that, Bill, and, and then you and I can take it offline yet again. Okay. Okay. And, and I would really like for us to try to, to uh, maybe find some common ground here. Oh, I'd love but, that. But I would say the six years you served on the advisory council, you were an invaluable resource, and you gave us a lot of good input. And, and I do know that this topic came up all the time, and we, we kept thinking and we were clearing it up. And that is, our sanctuary advisory councils go beyond what the fisheries management councils do. We have people that are sitting at this table that are here representing conservation and environmental groups. We have people that are representing a, a full range of, of stakeholder interests in the Keys, a lot more than just fishing. If you go to the Fisheries Management Council meetings, they too are represented by very expert people that are selected in, in a very similar process as the way this council is. But the interest here is much broader. There are people possibly around this table that may never go fishing but want to know that there are still fish out there. And, and they have a right. They have a right to feel just as strongly about fish being out there 
as the fisherman does that wants to go catch them. So when we manage sanctuaries, we manage for a much broader cast of the net. And, and that's where we have to work in with our fisheries colleagues. They do fisheries management. They set the bag limits, they set the size limits, they set the maximum sustainable yield. They go into seasons, they do all these tools. But what we do is we take it one step further if we feel that we need to restore part of the ecosystem entirely and have it intact, then, then that's when we start using the, the other tools that we have available. So let's stop there. Okay. They're, 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 we're, we're similar, but we're not. We're not. No, I don't understand. Okay. Thank you, Thank Joel. You. Again, your input has been valuable. Thank you for letting me uh, get in there. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Question. Yes. So I imagine you're probably aware that this sanctuary here is currently undertaking a marine zoning regulatory review process. I'm just wondering, do you foresee any applications with NOAA's recreational fishing initiative towards this review process here? Is, is the rec fish initiative going to become directly engaged? Yes. Uh, we no, probably not. I mean, I, you know, at the national level, what we try and do is sort of set a national framework within fisheries, and then push that out to our regions, and then they are able to sort of tailor that, customize that, uh, in a way which works in each region. So where I can see fisheries becoming involved in that is. If we have regional staff from fisheries involved in that process, what they would do in their representation at the table is to carry forward sort of the, the, the principles and policies, uh, uh, guiding principles from this into their position at the table there. But we wouldn't, does that make sense? Um, so we basically, yeah. I mean, I, I can help here. I mean, yeah. Russ is we talk all the time, Russ knows what our process is at the, at the highest level, but basically you know, as it starts with the local community level through the advisory council, and then if there are any changes that affect uh, fishing, recreational fishing, that, that's coordinated with our, our regional fisheries office uh, in St. Pete where, where Russ is, and, and that's as if any changes happen to our regulations, they're fully aware. It's just, it's a matter of communication and coordination. Uh, so that they, they're talking to council members, there's people outside the Keys, they're interested, you know, they, they, you know there's a trip, trips here, and, you know, Gary's here, and, you know, so that, you know, the, the representatives from different organizations at a higher level are also. Yeah, just so, so that was clear what Sean said, is that I'm in St. So I'm a national guy, I wear a national hat, but I actually live in Sarasota and work out at the St. Pete office. Yeah, I had a question about that, um, uh, the blast. Yeah. You said, can you kind of uh, just explain a little bit more? Of, of <laughs> I can get the economist to, tell, to call you. Yeah. yeah, well, I'm just curious how, you know, because it's so, you know, data, you know, specific or, yeah. or intensive, how, how would something like that uh, account for something like, a, you know, catch and release side of recreational sports fishing? If you can't answer that specifically, maybe you can point me in the right direction. To yeah, so it is a very data intensive model, and they actually have to do, it, it often takes more than a full year to conduct various surveys on how, on anglers, how they uh, how they fish, what they're releasing. Uh, they, and then they, but they're taking the data that they have from our assessments, including release, discard and release mortality, uh, estimates uh, and incorporating that in there uh, so I'm not quite sure what you're asking of how would we incorporate the release well, you know for instance, it's like you know it's not just release mortality but like overall catch and release effort uh, yeah. you know in terms of a, a side of recreational sports fishing that's right. driving you know the, the data behind that model <clears throat> and therefore you know some of the uh, regulations or you know plan and implementation I'm just wondering where you know, that kind of data comes from and how, you know, this, uh, NOAA would go about collecting it. So um, they do, a, they do a whole series of different surveys beforehand. I don't know what all the variables in particular are, uh, but certainly 
the catch and release uh, uh, practice and the rates at which that is uh, uh, practiced is factored into to uh, the blast model. But let me let's talk afterwards, and I, and I I can get either your specific question or I can put you in touch with the folks who actually run the models, and they can speak to it much better than I can. Steve and then Don. I believe this is a step in the right direction, and I also believe that, that things are seem to be getting better as far as understanding, but understanding is, is the key to reducing this tension that we have. Um, but I, again, I do believe it's getting better. And what, what I wanted to say is that at least in the keys, uh, on a national level, level I'm lost, but talking about the keys, I, I strongly agree with, the, um, and I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't get your name from Key Colony Beach. Jerry Ellis, thank you. Yeah, and uh, I strongly agree with him that you need to include, especially in the Keys, different uh, groups in any type of meeting if they want to come and, and supply information. It's a very diverse as far as fisheries go between Isla Mirada, Key Largo, Key Colony, and Key West. And I think we all need to uh, be included in this. And, and also including the state and federal agencies along with the national agencies to get this on at least where laws and regulations overlap to get a, to get a common understanding of, of, of those laws. Um, you can look at a website and get the, the regulations, but still where they overlap, there's not an understanding. So again, to relieve tension, I think understanding is the key. And the more input and more everybody understands, I think it's, it's, it's a step uh, to making things uh, better. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So as, as, you know, the planning for this workshop evolves, we'll talk with John and, and others and execute. Don and then Chris, and I'd like to wrap it. Well, I was uh, looking at your statistics there. It said uh, 1.8 million uh, anglers in, in Florida. And I was sort of wondering where that uh, number came from. And the reason that I'm wondering it is because we have a lot of fisheries that are not straight fishing. We have all the scallop people, the lobster people, for instance. Uh, you have roughly a little less than a thousand people a day move to Florida. And uh, it's my understanding that anywhere from 8% uh, to 20% of those people they end up getting into the fishing for fun and whatnot. And how you come up with a count like that, 1.8 million, is that all those individual licenses together and uh, per year? Or is that uh, 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 include like temporary licenses that come from people from out of state that trailer the boats down and so on? Is that a lump sum thing or is it actually a variable? That is a snapshot of the licensed anglers in Florida in 2013. So we draw our uh, angler participant numbers from uh, the state license database. There, there's something called the National Angler Registry, which is which required, Congress required us to set it up. And basically what we have done is uh, we have agreements with all the states to uh, uh, obtain from them their databases on license <coughs> activities. And there's a few states that don't have licenses, but they have registries, collect the same information, and just don't get the state back. Um, and so it's, uh, it's drawn from that Florida State database. Well, the, the other part, part of that is like, like for instance, I'm of an age now where I don't have to get another license. Right. So. Uh, do I show up on the polls automatically every year? So it's, not under, it's a known underestimated. It also misses kids who are uh, under 16 in most cases. A lot of states have exemption for um, active duty military, right. et cetera. So it's a known underestimate, but it's the metric that we, we have. It's the best available metric that we have. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Chris? That's all right. Editorial comment, and then uh, back to the question by the presentation. There have been this, this discussion about who, who can go to meetings and who can't because of the complexity of attending. I would just say one of the things I really like about this council 
is that it's focused on the keys, it's focused on the place that, that I'm focused on. If I want to have input or influence on, on the decision making, it's one thing I can be on the council if I get selected, or anybody from the public can come and make public comment and really have access to this place that they live and work. I think it's a really challenging thing for a recreational fisherman or a commercial fisherman for that matter to um, have their voice heard, their individual voice heard. Um, when you get into the fishery management arenas and their Gulf Council, the South Atlantic Council, the State Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, you know, if I have an issue and I want to advance it, I've got to chase one council all over the southeastern United States, I've got to chase another council all over the Gulf of Mexico, and then I've got to chase the Gulf Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission all over the state of Florida to every movement issue. You know, it's one thing to go and make and say your piece. We know that in order to really make something happen, you need to dog these things. And this is why you've got representatives uh, from, from that represent recreational fishing people. Yeah. And they get to do that. It's their job. Yeah, you guys are in probably the most complex regulatory space in the country with all the overlap between the councils, the uh, 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 Department of Interior uh, properties down here, or, or areas, uh, the states, everything else, it is incredibly complicated here. Much more so than anywhere else. So to, to get to my question, and uh, uh, just to finish my, my thought, I think if we were to take the recreational and other fishing representatives just from this council and, and pull them aside into a sub-meeting and say, how would you, for the Florida Keys space, solve the Magnuson mm -hmm. challenge, you know, how would you deal with shallow water group, or how would you deal with this and that? I think you get some really interesting input, and you just you never get it because um, the system isn't set up to take it. So back to a couple yeah. rolls back in your slide, there's something about regional implementation. Now, does that mean, what is the region? Is that at the scale of the council, or that, could that be at the scale of the marine sanctuary space, or the peace space, or, or what is that? It, that it's, it's really, it's related to so for this region, it is North Carolina to Texas to uh, the U.S. Caribbean. So that is, so fisheries, yeah, fisheries has five regions around the country. We've got basically New England, New England, the Mid-Atlantic, South, uh, are, are under one region. Then we've got the Southeast U.S., the Gulf and Caribbean is another. The West Coast of the U.S. is another. Then Alaska is its own. and Pacific Insular Islands, Hawaii, and, and the Guam, American Samoa, or whatnot. And so in this case, it is uh, it is covering that sort of triangle, North Carolina, Puerto Rico, or USVI to Texas. Uh, so it deals more regularly, I would say, with the Fishery Management Council uh, sort of areas of jurisdiction. However, it includes a lot of habitat work uh, or I, ex I anticipate that it will when I see a draft, uh, which it obviously is, will require a lot of collaboration with states and, and councils and ostensibly sanctuaries. Um, and it, so it could include uh, sanctuaries work. I don't know to the extent that, that the key sanctuary and our staff who work on this plan have been in communication or not. If there's appropriate projects that, that Sean and others think would be a good fit, we're happy to take what we call a cross-line office, that would be NOS or sanctuaries into NOAA, uh, NOAA fisheries kind of project. So um, it is in general lar much larger, but it certainly doesn't exclude the uh, possibility of including sanctuary stuff if, if they felt it was appropriate to uh, incorporate. All right, thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I'd like to move on and we could go down a bunch of different rabbit holes here. And I certainly have an opinion and like to weigh in on it. Um, we do have an agenda and I'd like to stick to it. So if we could uh, shift gears and bring Jim Portman up here and talk about what the things that one of us are interested in. Thanks for all the input. Thanks, Bill. You ready, Chris? Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a remote control, so I'm going to be saying next slide. Because, it's right in front of you. No, no, the problem is I embedded videos on my computer, and when I move it, it doesn't seem to work very well. Um, so I, uh, I was asked to come talk to you guys about the uh, Florida Bay Seagrass Dial. 
uh, let you know what's going on and what we know is going on so far. And, and I'll start that with a story. Did Charlie just walk over? Because I was going to tell her about him. Um, <laughs> so the expanded one. In, in uh, 1987, I'd been working down here as a graduate student for quite a long time at that point, and I've been, I was based out of the Audubon Society in, in Tavernier. And uh, the Park Service at that point really had a, a very minimal science uh, component in Florida Bay, and the people that were doing all the work in Florida Bay were Audubon Society. So reports from fishing guides and from avid uh, fishermen started coming in about a big seagrass die off in the western part of Florida Bay. And Charlie was um, uh, quite vocal, and he he tried to get a real expert to go out with him, but all he could get was me, so I went out with him. Uh, we, we went uh, south of the Pelican Key, south of, uh, of Flamingo, and we looked at vast basins of dead seagrass. There were piles of seagrass leaves, and, um, and, and Charlie was insisting that this was a problem. Uh, I've never been more wrong in my life. I, I actually still have a copy of the letter I wrote to Charlie that uh, after that day that said, you know, it's a normal feature in a hot summer to have leaves slough off the tops of those big banks. They pile up in deep water. This is nothing to worry about. Um, and that was really, really wrong. So uh, what, what we, we're seeing now, uh, I could actually jump to the chase where everyone with gray hair here, here. What we're seeing now is exactly like 1987. All right? This is a picture of floating dead seagrass that was taken about two months ago in Rankin Lake. Uh, go to the next, Chris. So there was a, a large response it, to the 1987 die-off that really didn't get going until about 1991. And, and in fact, um, uh, George Barley and others were involved in, in using the fate and the changes of Florida Bay to implement water management uh, law, rule, findings, whatever, for everybody's basin. So it, uh, a bunch of us, a number of people are still involved, got together and, and we started looking at what was known about seagrass, why was it dying, how big it was, and what would follow on effects of seagrass die off. And I don't know how well it shows up, but um, around the world, if you talk to seagrass biologists or, or estuarine scientists, and you say seagrasses are dying, they'll say, well, of course they are. They're dying everywhere. They've been dying since the 19th century. And it's because uh, we're damaging water quality. The water quality then is, is getting to the point where not enough light reaching the bottom and the seagrasses are dying. But that's not what's going on in Florida Bay. This is a picture of the 1987 die-off. And this is the Lassia Meadow that looks really, really dense. And this is the dead stuff. And then there's this really sharp boundary between what was dead and what was alive. And there's a, a huge amount of, of dead leaf material piled up in there. And the next verse. This is a, an underwater picture from the same place. So this is the, the bottom. And this was the top of the water. And this is the reflection of that dense seagrass meadow off the top of the water. The water was beautifully clear, and the grass was dying. and we had a difficult time understanding why. Next one, Chris. When you looked down at the grass, what you saw was that the, um, the skeletons of the grass, these are called the sheathing leaves, the outside leaves, were all still there. Uh, but it kind of looked like it got uh, cut off with a scythe or, or mowed down. So we started calling this stubble fields. So there were stubble fields left everywhere. Uh, and the leaves that all came off of here ended up accumulating and sinking and then causing further problems because there's a huge mat of leaves now rolling around on the bottom. Uh, this one isn't a video, is it, Chris? No. No, it's not. All right, next one. So uh, large areas of, of seagrass has died. I'll show you the areas in a minute. But there were follow-on effects after that. Um, so the grass has died in clear water. And about three or four years later, we started having uh, the algae blooms that drastically impacted the entire Florida Bay, including the sanctuary uh, uh, ecosystem. These are data from Butler. Um, so this is so this is 91, and this is percentage of sponges that were dead. So in 91, that was four years after the seagrass die-off. There really weren't any sponge deaths, but then there were huge cyanobacterial blooms. Uh, blueberry algae blooms, and when those started happening north of Marathon, north of Long Key, then we started to see large uh, sponge 
die off events. These big loggerhead sponges were dying off. And the recurrent cyanobacterial blooms led to uh, more and more sponges dying off. And of course, that cascades for a number of reasons. These are a lobster underneath the sponge, so the, a large part of the lobster nursery habitat was lost because the sponges were no longer there. The lobster, um, the number of, of juvenile lobsters went way down in that area. And then this is a, a modeling paper that one of my postdocs did. And these are the, the changes in the amount of time it takes to filter the water in Florida Bay through sponges because of sponge die off. So historically, before 1991, we figured that in this part of the bay, the entire water column in Florida Bay was going through a sponge about four times a day. Uh, once the sponges died off, it became over 12 days in the central part of Florida Bay. So it, it, the, that sponge filtration rate went way up. So this then led to the exacerbation of the phytoplankton bloom. So what I should say is these, these cyanobacterial blooms, they were toxic to the, the sponges, but those weren't the only kind of plankton that were blooming. There were diatoms blooming and dinoflagellates blooming, and all of those things are sponge food. So that was further uh, adding to the water quality problem. Once the sponges were dead, then the sponges couldn't clear the water, et cetera. So the following effects. These are just uh, pictures. So this was seagrass die off that was, as it was occurring in 87, 88. Uh, then this is what what's the system started to look like in 91, 92. So the nutrients that had been locked in the soil in this very, very phosphorus limited environment, this clear water place that that we all uh, know and love, um, those nutrients started to be released. And, and so this is very slimy grass. So this is what grass looks like that's dying around the world because of water quality issues created by uh, human misuse of the watershed. You get all this diatom bloom. But in, in our case, this came way after, years after the, the seagrasses themselves died. <coughs> so while this was happening, I was young. Um, I. I had hair. Uh, <laughs> I, can I hear you? Um, yeah, I had hair, but but actually, I was I was physically, I was emotionally bereft. This place that I loved was like falling apart. It was it was changing in character. The ways that the places I used to fish, I couldn't fish anymore, and I was really, really, really upset. Um, now the the people that weren't here in '87 that work in Florida Bay are that way. They're, they're really upset. Um, next slide. So, um, seagrass die-offs in Florida Bay had been reported on small scale by Durbin Tab and others, but very, very small scale. And there hadn't been these really <coughs> large die-offs. I've still, I still haven't shown you how big they were. And in these die-offs, so this is basically just the salinity in Florida Bay. And this line here, that's, that's seawater sea salinity. And then the dark bars, this is rainfall in Miami, uh, the dark bars correspond to droughts. And you can see that every time there's a drought, salinities go up. Uh, there's a drought, salinities go up. There's a drought, salinities go up. So in this 1987 period, there was a severe drought. Salinities went up in the middle part of Florida Bay. So 50 parts per thousand on average for two years is one and a half times the seawater. Uh, there were actually individual records up there of 72 which is the same that happened this year. So there was this large area of hypersalinity, and not only was it hypersaline, but it was also very warm. Now this becomes, I'm gonna tell you why the grass has died, um, and it has to do with oxygen. You know, you, we all learned that plants use oxygen, and, and I'm sorry, animals use oxygen and plants give it off, but, but plants need oxygen for their metabolism as well. So, um, in hot, salty water, you can only fit about 60% of the oxygen in that water as you can in normal seawater at normal temperatures. So if you consider that as the amount of oxygen that is there to support the grasses when the sun goes down, there was only 60% of that in the water column. When the sun went down and it was still really warm, respiration rate is a function of temperature. So the plants and the bacteria and the animals use up all the oxygen and it leads to hypoxia or very, very low oxygen concentrations through the canopy of the grasses. The next one, Chris. And 
So hypoxia is a relatively common thing in seagrasses. And as long as the hypoxia in that seagrass meadow doesn't last too long, um, the oxygen that is stored within the plant gets used up through the night and then the lights come back on and they start photosynthesizing and create oxygen again. But what seemed to be happening, so here's our, our Thalassia cartoon. This is supposed to be the sediment surface and I'm a really bad uh, computer graphics cartoonist so I never finish this. So I'll just, I'll just wave my arms about it. So this is where the plant grows from. This is called the, the meristem. So that's where all the new tissue is being produced. It's the metabolically very active part and it's actually below the mud. It's, it's in, down in the sediment. Um, those meristems use oxygen day and night. And what this is from a, a 2005 paper that we did. So this is the amount of oxygen in the water. And the oxygen in the water then drops down to very, very, very low. And this is uh, oxygen in the meristem. And the meristem is, is in here. So we actually put little microelectrodes into the plants. So in order to get death of these meristems. First, you need to work all the oxygen out, and then when that happens, sulfides intrude. So sulfide is that rotten egg smell. It's, it's, it's incredibly toxic. It's so toxic that your nose can detect it at parts per trillion because our ancestors and the organisms that gave rise to us knew that if they smelled it, they had to get the hell out of there. All right, so it's really, really toxic. So when all the oxygen gets uh, used up in the meristem, then you get sulfide entry, and that's what's killing the seagrass. And that's what killed it in 87, and apparently that's what's killing it now. Next one. This is a video. Go ahead and click that. This is Penny Hall's hand. I should have said that most of the data I'm going to show you is Penny's data out of her lab. So this, is the, this was a month ago. Seagrass is not supposed to come up like that. So it actually still looks alive and healthy, but the meristem's dead, and, and the leaves just don't know it yet. So they, they pull up, and that's why we get this stubble feel that's left, it's that death underground. Next one. So, um, in 1987 to 1990, uh, it's these pink patches I want you to look at. That's where seagrasses died back then. And if you wonder why this pattern, you know, wh why is there, a lot of seagrass death over here and not very much seagrass death over there. It's, it's related to the long-term capture of phosphorus within the system and, and the density of seagrass. So this is very dense seagrass here in general and it gets sparser as you go that way. So the denser the seagrass is, the more oxygen it uses at night down in the, in the sediment and soil. So these, the, the only seagrasses that died during the initial phase of the die-off were incredibly dense meadows and they used up all that oxygen. So that explains these over here, but it doesn't explain these here. And, and those are places basically on the south sides of banks where organic matter accumulates because it, it sloughed off the north on the, during winter storms and it accumulates on the south side. Anybody that's fished those banks knows that it's hard on the north side and soft on the south side. So the south side of the banks is very dense seagrass and those dense seagrass meadows on the south side of the banks died off as well in the same fashion. Now, in response to the seagrass die-off, a number of things happened. First, there was no water quality data for Florida Bay other than a couple of graduate student reports um, until my dissertation work that happened in response to the seagrass die -off. Uh, There also wasn't routine monitoring of seagrasses in the bay until uh, Mike Duraco and then Penny Hall's taking it over started uh, a habitat assessment program. So these green basins are basins that they chose to begin routine monitoring. These have been monitored since the early 90s. And you can see that some of the basins, Johnson Key Basin, Rankin Lake, Whitbrae, uh, and, and Rabbit Key especially, were areas that died off um, in that 87, 90 die off that they focused on. And then there were of course other banks or other basins where they were uh, looking as well. So the next slide. So their data, Penny's data, over the years shows what happened. So this is 1986. There was dense seagrass that went from the shallow banks to the basins up onto the shallow banks. Um, it got warm and hot and salty at, at the wrong time of year. 
and we saw death in place of seagrass in, in a clear water column that basically spread from the deeper water up into the banks. These are these piles of grass blades that were kind of rolling around, capping oxygen from getting into the soil. Um, and then we started to see, uh, three or four years later, there were some survivors. It isn't 100% mortality. There are pieces, there, there's a shoot here, a shoot there that survives. So in 1990, uh, the data was showing a slight recovery from that initial die off, but then in 91, 92, leading into 1995, we, we had this period of really bad water quality being fueled by the phosphorus coming up out of the soil. And then that led to general light limitation across the entire western half of Florida Bay. And it killed more sponges and it affected fishing. Um, slowly, the lighter part of the 1990s, uh, grasses started getting a foothold and the phosphorus that's up in the water column started being trapped back down in the soil. Uh, it was 2000, 2009, um, and 2009 it looked almost like it did before the die-off. So these are just trajectories of three different species of grass. Uh, they grow at different rates. Um, one of them is like the weed that comes in fast, and another is like the tree that eventually replaces the weeds if you leave it there for a long time. So turtle grass basically had a very low relative density and, and increased. Um, shoal grass peaked. Uh, early on and then was displaced eventually by the thalassidae. So it, it takes 25 years for these events to work through, or at least the last one took 25 years uh, until uh, this year when it started to die again. So uh, fishing guides once again started reporting these large masses of floating leaves. This is looking out across towards Manowar Key and Johnson Key Basin. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Uh, same thing's happening. Uh, the water's really clear and then the grass dies. Um, so this is grass that's in the process of dying right now and if you pulled on these shoots they would come up because it's dead and it just doesn't know yet. Next slide. Um, underwater we're seeing stubble fields that look identical to 1987 stubble fields. Next Chris. And so this is a, a large mat of dead seagrass leaves in a, in a little depression and there's I, I don't know if you can see it this this green color that green color or sulfur oxidizing bacteria that are actually instead of using light from the sun to make uh, sugar they're using sulfide coming up from the rotting seagrass uh, to, to make sugars um, and then the next slide I think is this the yeah so we're, we're seeing a phenomenon that seems to be much more extensive this time than it was in 87, unless we just weren't looking right. It's called the yellow fog. So this is, uh, I've got some pictures of it, or a video of it in a minute. It uh, seems to be a suspension of elemental sulfur and sulfur bacteria that uh, just moves around kind of as a cohesive water mass you know, the, when the wind's not blowing. So Chris, I think the next one's a picture of yellow fog or, or a video. Um, is, yeah, so, so there's yellow fog sitting in a depression, and so it's, it's just sulfur, and you stir it up and it just kind of moves that way. Alright, you can go on the next one please. Um, more pictures of what it looks like in, in Rankin Lake right now. Um, next one, Chris. So what's a die-off look like today compared to the last die-off? So for, luckily, um, FWC has continued to monitor, otherwise we wouldn't have the data that we need to tell you what's happening. Chris is gonna talk to you about the problem with water quality data and the continuity of water quality data. But in this case, we have uh, continuous benthic habitat monitoring data. And we know that in, in these basins that they monitor, this one, this one, this one, and this one, there's about 5,000 acres of dead seagrass. Um, and that is uh, very precisely known because it's based on remapping of the same plots. When you... Um, start looking more in general. So this is where, right, right in here, is actually where Charlie took me in 1987. Um, we now know that all that's dead too. 
So uh, the, when I, I gave this presentation in front of the National Academy CISREP CISRA panel two weeks ago, and I could say that there's about 10,000 acres of Florida Bay that's, that is under the influence of seagrass die-off. But I think the next one is, this was uh, presented yesterday. Um, this is Chris Cavanaugh and, and uh, Vicki Abstin's mapping of the seagrass die-off. They now say there's about 40,000 acres that are affected. And that doesn't mean there's 40,000 acres of dead bottom, but there are at least 40,000 acres in which there is active seagrass die-off happening right now. In Rankin Lake and Rankin Bite, about 90% mortality, only about 10% of the grass left. Over here in Johnson Key, it's 60 to 80% mortality. And the, these areas uh, are basically largely like Rankin Lake. So there's huge, huge areas of dead seagrass. Uh, if you map the, uh, what we knew in, in the 80s and, and what we see now, um, this is where it started in the 80s and uh, it moved out. And this is where we see it now uh, this year. And there's potential that it could move out and, and cover more areas. Um, plug once again for FWC and their data collection. This is um, 95 is when their data collection started. So that was eight years after seagrass die off. So really what they did is they uh, hopefully collected the data that are going to allow us to predict how the system is going to respond for the next 20 years. Uh, Thalassia generally increased for 15, 20 years, reached a, a stable plateau, and then bam, went, went right down. So this is 2015 spring. That's their normal sampling. When they got a report of the seagrass die-off, they came out and they sampled 2015 in the fall. And, and it's way down. So these are, are just the other species that are there as well. So halidu is way down, and, and syringodium had been on its way down anyway. The next slide. Um, that Johnson Key Basin, these data are now a few months old. The thalassia increased, and it stayed stable. Uh, it began its step down. Now these are the averages of 30 sites. And really what this means is there hasn't been a 25% reduction in thalassia density across the entire system. It's in the northern part of that Johnson Key Basin system, there's 100% loss, and that's moving to the south. <clears throat> uh, these are, once again, Penny's data. Uh, just This is in uh, May. The darker it is, the more grass there was there. And that's before the die-off events. Uh, and it's restricted basically just to these five basins, because that's where we have data. Um, then when they went back out, you'll notice this one here is not green anymore uh, because that's Rankin Lake where the, the die-off, at least in these data, seems to be centered. And then this is the, the change map. So it's those areas that make up 5,000 acres. That's where that 5,000 number comes from. So why? Um, this is a, actually a really complicated graph that Brad Furman and Penny's lab put together. And what it shows you is that this is a mean temperature up here. And then these are um, number of days in a month that exceeded different salinities. Starting back in 1997 going up to 2015. And when you see red, those are the number of days when the salinity was over 60 parts per thousand at the uh, rank or the Garfield White Station actually got up to 72. So you see that um, it actually was abnormally warm. That it's not really borne out in these data, but it is in other people's data sets. So it was very warm. We had a wet season that didn't happen until the dry season. Uh, it got very salty and stayed very salty. And then this tr this trend here is the, um, the grass density in Rankin Lake, so you can see it was rebounding from, from the 87 die-off, uh, reached this dense state, and then as soon as we got this really long, hot, salty period, it, it started dying. So, water balance, in, this is a 
from a different kind of study. Water balance in Florida Bay is on a knife edge all the time. It's 2,000 square kilometers of really, really shallow, really warm tropical water. And the amount of rain that falls into the bay is a little bit less on an, av on an annual average than the amount of rain that gets evaporated out of the bay. And what that means is um, without freshwater runoff into the top of the bay, the system would always be hypersaline. And In 1987, we thought we learned a lesson of the, the need to supply fresh water in the Florida Bay to protect those seagrasses in Florida Bay and then to protect the water quality of the sanctuary. But the lessons and the politics of, of, seem to have clashed. And once again this year, um, we, we seem to have started all this all over. So uh, take questions. I'm sorry, I, Ken, you gonna call people or, or should I call them? Um. <clears throat> We could have a short discussion, but I would like to uh, hold off on a lot of discussion until we hear the next presentation. Um, but we could do a few questions right now. Okay. And then how about sorry. Uh, hi Jim, uh, this is very disturbing. Um, we've had an unprecedented rain event over the last week or so. In fact, the salinity in, uh, in the bay off of Lower Matacombe was down to 30, and usually it's 38 to 40. And I just wonder if that rain event might have helped the situation. You, you very well could have skipped, but what I did cover is there seemed to be a bunch of positive feedbacks. So when the grass was healthy, we didn't have a lot of oxygen in the water column, and the grass died. And that was largely driven by salinity and temperature, that, that initial lack of oxygen. But now there's all that dead stuff called necromass floating around out there. So the real question is, have we kicked on a positive feedback that's going to make the bay die uh, in the way that it did in 1987 to 1995 again, no matter what happens to the ring? Or will the fact that um, actually, it went from 72 down to 35 in, in uh, Rankin Lake about two months ago because it started raining finally, uh, very, very late in the wet season, early in the dry season. So um, even though salinity has decreased, uh, the trigger looks like it's been pulled and the, the grass die-up areas still seem to be expanding. So maybe next year won't be like 1988 was, or maybe it will. We can hope. Yeah. Mimi? <clears throat> has, has there been any evidence of a similar die off on the Atlantic side? Because I've witnessed something similar. It's small in scale, but it's, uh, it's at the mouth of a creek that's adjacent to the Garda. It looks just like that. I, I would like to know the spot, so I'd like to go look at it. And one of the, the reasons that could be happening is because the, <coughs> of the canals are. Um, abnormally uh, dense seagrass meadows because of the, all the nutrients that we've been putting into the groundwater for the last 100 years in the Florida Keys. So if you look at a series of aerial photographs, the, uh, the offshore, the nearshore seagrass meadows have been getting denser for the last 100 years because we've been fertilizing. So without seeing what you're talking about, uh, it, the story I could concoct that would be consistent with what you're seeing is these abnormally dense beds at the mouths of these canals could be responding in the same way to the lack of oxygen and, and high temperatures, but we need to go see them. Well, this wasn't actually a canal. This was uh, uh, water coming out of shallow bays and back. Uh, but it, it also, there was precipitate of, uh, you know, the sponges have already died. Oh, yeah. They saw corals die. Where was it? Uh, right out in front of Geiger Creek, mm -hmm. Boca Chica. Yeah. And uh, right before that, the uh, sea urchins from the uh, sea biscuits died. I mean, it was quite precipitous in <coughs> August. And I, is there any evidence that there's a cyanobacteria bloom? Not, not uh, We haven't seen it yet. Um, doesn't mean that it hasn't happened down there. Thank you. Okay. Bob and then Billy. <coughs> Uh, what data are available as to the impact of the die-off uh, 
and is it going to follow the same cycle? Since you've had time since the early <coughs> 90s to look at this, well, what's happening out there? All right, so uh, I said that I was physically ill in 1987-88 when this was happening. Now I started getting calls that seagrasses were dying in Florida Bay again, and I said, oh yeah, makes sense to me, in 20 years it'll be over. And I didn't get that upset, but all the young ones, everyone was really upset. So I think if we don't get any worse with water management, we may be looking at something that's set up to happen every 25 years or so, which means half of Florida Bay and a large part of the sanctuary is going to have impaired fishing, impaired water quality for at least half the time, if, if this is just dying off every 25 years. Um, I said yes about 12 times in that last statement. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that's because we, we just really don't know. Um, but the, the last die off, uh, fishing guides took it on a year because no one wanted to go sight fishing when you couldn't see the water. Um, you know, the three years after the original die-off in, in Rankin Lake, fishing guys used to take their customers there into the dead zone to fish for redfish at the end of every day so that they had some meat to bring home. And, and until the, the uh, algae boom started, and then, then that hung up as well. Uh, John Hunt can probably talk about what happened to lobsters and, and lobster fishery uh, in response to the last die-off, since he was involved in all that. John, you want to... Sorry, I surprised you. Here I am, back here in Adrian. There, I mean, there, there, there was an, an effect on, on the juvenile lobster population locally in that portion of the Bayside and they, they certainly lost the habitat from uh, the sponge die-off. Those cyanobacterial blooms have been continuing through the years, uh, perhaps on the smaller scales, but certainly continuing through the years. So there's additional factors going on that I think relate, relate to the persistence of, of the cyanobacterials most recently, just two years ago, <coughs> in that same region of the So that whole region has a smaller general function population. Exactly what that means in terms of the impact of the fishery, I think is just an underlying uh, you know, reduction in, in juvenile production um, that is part, is part of the cycle of uh, changes in the and so, and personally, um, the places I used to fish for sea trout all the time when when I was a starving graduate student, I needed to eat sea trout. I haven't been able to catch trout there in 20 years. Um, so there, there, that means that the system changed uh, in 1987, 88 in a way that's still affecting the distribution of a recreational fishing effort across the entire system. So, am I allowed to ask a question? I got the mic. I do. I don't want to interrupt. You. Can it be a quick question? <laughs> so I'm actually kind of asking this uh, on behalf of of the uh, original person that that started all this, Charlie, in taking you out to to Rainbow Lake and Gripway Basin back when. Uh, we're graduate students, so going back to that. And, and Charlie's question, I think it's probably a, a general question, is if, if there were adequate, if there was a water management system that was feeding this region in a, in a kind of normal way, um, would the, what is your sense on how that would change the the trajectory of initiating die-offs you know, in, in these kinds of, of regions. And, and would that be a sufficient buffer to either ameliorate or eliminate this kind of, of point of high percent? So, John, Charlie, the only, the only thing I had to base this on is my professional judgment after spending the last 35 years out there. And, um, 
we know that that little bit of water that comes in through the northern boundary of Florida Bay is a, a vital part of the water budget. Uh, the system has always tended to hypersalinity, at least as far back as our records go, which is only in the 50s, but in the 50s water uh, delivery to the bay had already been altered. Um, if you go back to Durbin Tan's writing, and Durbin was a fabulous naturalist, and he knew everybody. Uh, there is no record before 1987 of an event like the 1987 record. And now, 30 years later, we're seeing the same thing that happened in 1987. So it, anecdotally, these, these things seem to become more severe and more frequent. But there's a very, very small sample to base that on. Uh, and we know that where this is starting is what used to be the main delivery of water out of the Taylor Slough uh, drainage, but then that's not where the water goes anymore. Uh, now it's also possible that after 5,000 years of, after, so Florida Bay flooded about 5,000 years ago with rising sea level, it could also be possible that after 5,000 years we finally accumulated enough phosphorus that the system would do this anyway. Uh, I tend not to think so. I don't think I was lucky enough to live at the exact critical threshold moment in time. Thank you, Billy, and then we'll take a break. Okay, well, very quick, very quickly, uh, I think that the, the stage was set in 1980. Rock Salt and I used to talk about very often in the 90s when this was happening that uh, you maybe remember when they were having to shoot deer from the helicopters because their legs were running off in the Everglades in 1980. They dropped the canal levels two and a half feet at that point. Those canal levels have never come back up. And in, in fact, we had development encroach into the eight and a half square mile area. We had agriculture move west. So they have not been a able to bring that water level back up in those canals. That set the conditions for less water going into the system. But what you left out, Jim, and I, I know you know this, but I want to point it out, is that not only was Florida Bay and the seagrasses dying in 1987, Jay Zeman came into my office when I was managing Lou Key at Bay of Honda, all upset, and said, Billy, the seagrass is all dying on the, on, in, in Florida Bay. And I said, Jay, the entire reef track is white. So we had a massive, the first ever massive coral bleaching event that was to the Caribbean wide extent and, and on the uh, Pacific side of Panama in that area. And we had a massive amount of bleaching going on and the conditions similar to this year when we're having bleaching, slip calm, doldrum weather periods, uh, uh, slip calm, uh, water's heating up, oxygen saturation's going down and it sets the stage that you're seeing this year. And then we saw the same thing, uh, we're seeing it now again, it's, it's just almost a repeat. So we have to take the, the atmospheric conditions, <coughs> environmental conditions and make them all parallel. We can look at everything. The last thing I want to say is we need to start watching now closely. It was in December of uh, 2003 that we had a, a rain event like we're having right now. And it wasn't until March we heard about it. But starting in January of 2004, we had the, the massive black water event that started coming out of Shark River Slough in that area. And that was when the fresh waters came down. This is the theory. And John, you can correct me, the state was very integral in this, but the fresh water came down, flushed a lot of silica, uh, a, 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 a nutrient important for some diatoms. That met with a disintegrating red tide that was coming down the southwest coast. It was the perfect storm for the creation of the black water event. So it'll be interesting to see if we see something like that come. <coughs> Thanks. So, and Bill, you reminded me, of course, of the uh, bleaching events on the reef, and that was important. One thing I know you know that I want to say every time I'm around you is the corals are important, but uh, coral reefs make up only about 5% of the, the area of the bottom of the sanctuary, and only about 4% of that is living coral. Seagrasses make up about 90% of the bottom of the sanctuary. <laughs> for, for the record, other people come here to see the coral reef, but not necessarily see for, for the record, seagrasses are important. <laughs> Jerry, and then let's take a quick break.
Jim, I was at the um, Rankin and Lip Ray the other day, and what I was observing, I think, were the rhizomes of the actual plants coming up. Um, can you, I, I think it's clear, can you speak to the significance of that as opposed to just the, the blades coming up? These are halidulia rhizomes, or? Uh, I don't know. Uh, how, were they bigger on my finger, or were they? Uh, they were in between those two. The thing that really fuels these algae blooms is the, uh, the loss of the armoring on the bottom by the seagrasses. So the, the, one of the main reasons that seagrasses are important is they keep water clear by keeping sediment down on the bottom. So when you lose the blades, then wave action can affect the bottom. And then the muds in Florida Bay have a, a bulk density of around 0.8, which is really, really, really low. Um, so it's really easy to stir them up. So if now we've lost the, the baffling and we're getting the uh, erosion of the sediment so that the rhizomes of the thalassia are coming up, that would suggest uh, degradation of water quality is not far off because this stuff's all going up in the water column. A lot of the phosphorus, a lot of the, a, a lot of the chlorophyll in the water column in Florida Bay is normally, is chlorophyll associated with things that are normally benthic anyway. So, so they get stirred up into the water. Pond. Could be real bad. Now, another thing, though, if they were the really small rhizomes, um, this also right before the 87 die-off, Rankin Lake was completely covered with, uh, well, it was very common in Rankin Lake to see uh, halidulia and rupia stems coming up into the water column, growing out over the thalassia because they were shaded and there was enough nutrient there. So it depends on what you saw. Uh, I remember that, and that is not what I was saying. They seem, you know, I wouldn't say they're big around as my finger, but I guess one finger. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, they were sizable, and I remember what you were describing, and it was not that. All right, Jim. Thank you very much. I'd like to. We're scheduled for a break. Let's we'll take about a ten-minute break, and then uh, come back, and we'll hear the next uh, presentation and have a discussion. My guess is we'll pick up this. Uh, pending motion after lunch. But I want to have plenty of time for a discussion. I want to have Jim available to talk because I want to combine our discussion um, after the next presentation. So see about 10 minutes. Discussion. We may or may not introduce our motion because we have to get Ron in and out of here before lunch. But we'll see how it goes. Take your time. Say what you need to say. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you guys very much. I'm. Uh, hopefully, you'll follow on the gym pretty nicely. I am uh, one of the younger guys. Didn't get to witness the 87, 89 one. And I really hope not to be back here when I look like Jim and tell you about another one. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I always going to talk a little bit more about water quality and some of the projects we have going on in water quality, uh, focusing first on its effect on spotted sea trout and other sport fish in Florida Bay, so kind of tying in with what Jim said, and then talk a little bit about, about kind of the broader water quality issues we have in South Florida. <coughs> so we have a number of monitoring programs that have been ongoing. Uh, most of them started in response to the original seagrass die-off uh, run by uh, FIU, then taken over by the South Florida Water Management District, us at uh, NOAA AOML, which is Atlantic Oceanographic Meteorological Lab, have run a water quality program for about 20 years now, uh, both in the sanctuary and upstream. And then uh, Miami-Dade Durham has one, and one of the newest ones that, that came online, which I, I really think is a, a cool model possibly, is there's a Biscayne Bay Water Watch, which is a citizen's water quality monitoring program where uh, any interested citizens get trained to go and collect the samples and bring them back to the lab and then the lab processes them. So it's a nice way to get, uh, to get a lot of people involved in the science and, and get the science done as effectively as possible. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to start with a little discussion on, on what water quality, specifically salinity, does to some of the opertrophic level species because 
Although seagrass and coral are important, you can't eat them. So it's important what they're doing to the fish and the shellfish and the, and the things that we can, we can harvest. So um, here's kind of a general viewpoint of the water quality programs going on. You guys recognize the sanctuary here. Here's Florida Bay. And then there's the area along the southwest shelf and Biscayne Bay that get monitored uh, very routinely as part of these programs. What I want to talk to you first about is this little area right here where we're doing a joint uh, program with the Fishery Science Center looking at water quality and sport fish populations. And if you notice, this is right where the seagrass die-off was that Jim was talking about. So we have direct data from that and, and it's linked just to some of the, some of the uh, sport fish as well. Um, as I mentioned, one of our main species we look at is juvenile spotted sea trout. Uh, for a couple reasons, they are a very uh, frequently targeted species. They also are good indicators because they spend their entire life history inside the bay. So instead of going out to the reefs like the snappers and groupers do and then coming back in and using the, the bay as a nursery habitat, they're there for their whole life cycle. Um, and interestingly, what you see with the, with the sea trout too is this relationship with salinity. When salinities get to be above 45, you start seeing decreases in the number and abundances of juveniles which you probably see. These guys are, are you know, about this big when you catch them. So they're little guys. And we're trying to see how many of those little guys are being recruited <coughs> each year, because then you can get an idea of how much, how that's affecting the, the adult population. So what you can see in, in these three areas, and so we have the west area, which is that area kind of west of Flamingo, includes Johnson Key Basin, but also Sand Key, that area out on the western side. So that doesn't have as strong a relationship with salinity. I think this is because it's so strongly influenced by the Shark River in that area, so you don't have the big hypersalinity events like you do in the Central Bay. Then you have Rankin Lake, Crocodile Drag over Wilk Bray Basin, which are all in that Central Bay. You see this real strong um, decrease in populations with, with salinity <coughs> over about 45. And we see that in the field data. Laboratory studies also show the exact same relationship, so it's pretty, pretty tight that this is what's going on. Um, <coughs> And what we've seen with juvenile spotted sea trout recruitment is that while the bay collapsed last year, juvenile spotted sea trout have been declining for about a decade now. We had a period of good recruitment years from 2004 to 2007, really centered in 2005 and 2006, and this was throughout the entire uh, area that we sample. Um, then sea trout have a seven to 10 year lifespan, and before the bay, seagrass style happened. I was fielding tons of calls and really starting to build uh, 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 some background on the um, guides in, in this area were no longer catching sea trout. They weren't catching the adults in <coughs> early, all of 2014, early 2015. I haven't followed up with them since about June because I've been distracted with seagrass dye. You know? um, but hopefully <coughs> I'll be able to follow up with them. Hopefully it's getting better. But you can see why that might be is that there just hasn't been good juvenile recruitment for seven to eight years now and that's throughout everywhere um, these guys like the seagrass the juvenile recruitment is a pretty strong assume the slave relationship there's also a pretty strong temperature relationship they don't like it when it gets really hot either above about 34 35 is, is their uh, lethal threshold so when you look at no, that's, there you go. So you look at salinity in this area, and this is the Whipray Basin salinity, very similar to what, what Jim uh, was showing, is that this period where we had good, good juvenile recruitment, especially in 2005 and, and 2006 in particular, you know, it's 2006 and 2007, which were the best years, they almost looked like the most normal kind of salinity regimes, what you would expect to see, a nice seasonality, with the red is showing from May through October, so starting at the beginning of the wet season, the salinities decrease and they don't get super hyper saline. They don't get super fresh either, but they do, do show this nice pattern here. So these were the years that, that, that had pretty high recruitment and also from Jim's graph, you'll remember this 2006 stood out in particular because there's almost no days in Garfield Bright where the salinity was over 40. So it was a really nice salinity regime that year. Then we had three or four years from 2008 through 2011 where we had significant hypersalinity over 45 in this, in this data set, with one year in between where it was better. And then we had these years that were lower salinity, but we didn't see the recruitment back. I'm not exactly sure why. It's kind of an abnormal salinity pattern in that we didn't kind of see this 
nice seasonal pattern like you see here. It's kind of more uh, almost uniform. The seasonality is not there. And then 2014, it never got fresh. And then that led to 2015 where we had hyperselenium. One of the things, uh, I guess John asked Jim this, and I, I strongly say one of the biggest evidence for why fixing water deliveries to Florida Bay would fix the seagrass is that in this case in particular, I was out there doing this sampling in uh, July of this year, and we were recording salinities of 70 on the bottom and temperatures over 38. And that was kind of a function of the salinity being so high, so it made the water column stratified. So you have the saltier water on the bottom and, and the fresher water on top of it. That water on the bottom was just warming up because of respiration, increased absorption. So if you were to, to knock the salinities down, I don't think you would have that, that pattern. And, if the seagrass died, I don't think it would be as severe as what we're seeing now. Uh, <clears throat> so that's kind of a little bit about what we're seeing. Now, what we've been able to do is, although we don't have records going back before about 1950, we've done some cores in the bay. So we have paleo salinity estimates of what the salinity used to be. And what we did here was uh, to create a target for Everglades restoration. We looked at the conditions of juvenile spotted sea trout uh, in August of 2009, so this was one of the, the high salinity years, and you can see <coughs> there's some poor, not suitable areas, and then it's almost all moderate. And then we looked at the same period, and it says 1975, because this is a year where we had uh, recreated the salinities of what it would have been if we had done full Everglades restoration. So if we were delivering all the water to the bay that historically had gotten to the bay based on those paleo records, and we would have this situation where most of the bay is good habitat for juvenile sea trout, some of it's even optimal, and there still is some fringes <coughs> of, of moderate or poor, but you can see the significant improvement between these two pictures. And almost any month we look at where we do this analysis, it's, it's, it's pretty striking how much the improvement can be gained by getting more water to the bay. <coughs> so that, that's a little bit about kind of the, the relationship between water quality, specifically salinity and temperature, and some of the trophic levels. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about is what we're seeing as far as nutrients and water quality. We talked a little bit about how the seagrass die-off uh, might lead to water quality issues. I'm going to look at more of a long-term approach first, and then I'll show you uh, an example of that positive feedback loop that, that Jim had mentioned. So what we're looking at in this, in this study is really, this is our, our water column kind of <coughs> index of health, where you have human health effects that are related to red tides and pathogens and toxins. You have eutrophication, which is essentially uh, nutrient pollution into the water. Too much nutrients is, is extremely devastating for us down here. We all like the nice clear water with being able to see the bottom, being able to sight fish and dive, and, and that's dependent on low nutrient inputs. And then you have the abiotic factors, which are your salinity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, water quality, and um, this is ocean acidification measurement here. <laughs> So we're going to look at just the uh, eutrophication one here and, and really focus in on what I'm seeing in the sanctuary. So what we looked at was to measure it is it, we have these conditions again, optimal, good, fair, poor, and critical. And basically you want both chlorophyll and nutrients to not be above the baseline values because we have pretty good baseline going to up to about 2005 is what we use as our baseline. So if it's uniquely above baseline, it's, it's a cause con for concern. And where it's really bad is where they're significantly above baseline and we have a significant increasing trend. And the way we looked at the trends was to look from 1995 onward. We cut it at 95, um, both because that was the end of the uh, kind of cyanobacterial bloom in Florida Bay, but also because there was a switch in the Atlantic with moldy decadal oscillation that actually affects uh, water quality in, in South Florida as well as a number of other things throughout the Gulf of Mexico, really. <coughs> So these are the areas we're going to focus in on are, is in the sanctuary. So we have these back bay and the back bay south, the Marquesas, this offshore area, and then the upper, middle, and lower keys, near shore Atlantic sides. So really the most striking thing that we've seen when we've looked at this data is this increasing trend in phosphorus. This is inorganic phosphorus, um, and this is all the different data that we have from 95 to 2013, and it's separated by region, but in each of these seven regions, we see an increasing trend in phosphorus. And phosphorus is, is the primary limiting nutrient, nutrient for not much of the sanctuary. So this is um, a concerning thing to me. We're still looking through it. This is still preliminary. 
make sure it's not some sort of data issue or, or switch of labs, but the fact that it's consistent across all the regions, it's also consistent across monitoring programs, has me pretty well convinced that this is, this is something we need, to, we need to keep track of. Um, and it's also not just limited to the sanctuary. We see this increase in phosphorus in Biscayne Bay, in Florida Bay, and on the southwest shelf, too. Not throughout the entire area, but it's 14 of the 21 zones that we looked at. And when you look at it on the map here, what we're seeing is if you look at about the increases, it's about tripling on kind of these back backside areas, and it's about a doubling on the offshore area and the, and the near shore Atlantic area. So just spatially, this could hint towards a kind of a source further upstream that could be contributing to this. But since it's also in these offshore areas, they're so far from that source, there, there's probably more than one thing at work here, and we really need to try and pin it down. As you guys know, there's many reasons that, that nutrients are bad for coral reef ecosystems, both for seagrasses and corals that inhabit them. So <clears throat> what we're trying to tease apart now is, is, is when we look at these trends, there's lots of um, interesting things we're seeing. Sometimes they're conflicting. So, so a bunch of us are putting our heads together and trying to figure it out. The, the SRP one's one of the most striking and, and the largest cause for concern. But there's other things, like when you look at total phosphorus and total nitrogen, they don't have elevated concentrations. And in fact, they have decreasing trends everywhere except for in manatee and barred sounds, that's, that's partially a, a relic of that, that road algae bloom that happened in the, in the mid-2000s. Um, <clears throat> same with inorganic nitrogen, it's really not increasing anywhere, and it's really not elevated anywhere. But phosphorus, 14 of 21 zones, increasing trend in all 14 of those zones. And then in these 14 zones that had phosphorus increases, nine of them also had increases in chlorophyll A. So chlorophyll A is kind of an, an index of how much uh, phytoplankton's in the water column. As Jim mentioned, you get too much phytoplankton in the water column, that's when you start having the shading effects on seagrass, and you can harm, harm your benthic communities of seagrass and corals as well. So this is the um, positive feedback loop that Jim was alluding to. And this starts with al increased algal growth, but you can enter it with a seagrass die-off too. But in essence, what you get is if you have too much increasing nutrients, you start increasing your algal growth, you know, you start seeing that increase in chlorophyll A, you get your blooms, you get your increased light attenuation then, you get the seagrass shading, you lose your benthic community, seagrasses, sponges, and when you lose your benthic community, it destabilizes the sediments, and then a lot of the sources of nutrients down here is actually sedimentary. So when you destabilize the sediments, when the roots are no longer there to keep the sediments down in, in a unified mat, if they're going into the water column, that increases the amount of, phyto, of, of nutrients available for the phytoplankton and actually increases the phytoplankton. And we've seen this a number of times. We saw this in Florida Bay in the mid-90s with that road bloom. I remember I came and talked to this very good group when that was starting and said, well, it could be years before it gets better. And, and unfortunately, I was right because this is exactly what happened there, um, where you lose the benthic community and then you just getting out of this loop is, is really tricky. And I want to stress, too, that you never, I don't think we've seen complete recovery in, in Florida Bay in some cases. We've seen complete recovery of seagrasses and some other things, but the sponges never came back. Um, so there's, there's some things that have changed, as Jim mentioned, that, that, that some fishing spots just never, never came back. Um, and what it did to the fish community, we don't have enough long-term data to really understand. Most of this data that I showed started in 2004. So. This is something to, to both be aware of with, with respect to, to the seagrass diet that we talked about and then also any kind of sign of increasing nutrients, it, it could be a cause for us. So it's just kind of two hypotheses I wanted to walk through for this. What we have of, of ways to kind of control these algal blooms, you have the bottom-up controls, which is uh, the increased nutrient loading. So you have land-based sources, canals, groundwater. You guys are, are very familiar with those in the keys from what you've just gone through with the sewering and everything. But then you also have atmospheric sources, and you have um, things like upwelling on the coral reefs that, increase, that include increased nutrients. And that can be um, increasing now as, as the Gulf Stream possibly slows down with climate change. It's one of the possible repercussions that as the stream slows down, you can have increasing upwelling into the, into the reefs. Um, <clears throat> and then there's top-down controls. The loss of the sponge community in some of these areas of Florida Bay in particular is just dramatic. And um, it kind of, one of the things I think about when, when I think about this stuff is, is 
I, I think it was Jerry I ran into out on Florida Bay one, one day during this summer when we were all out there and he was talking about how it's just not fair that he has to watch the Bay die twice in, in his lifetime. And, um, I, I think it, 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 it is not fair. I think it's, it's also, we need to move from watching it die to figuring out what we can do about it, both traditionally be it increasing, you know, what we've always talked about, we need more water, but then when these seagrass blades die, I mean, I thought, why don't we do an experiment and try to remove these seagrass blades that are dying and rolling around the bottom, and it's just making it worse. It, it, that's also part of the positive feedback that they, the, the seagrass style starts in the center of the bay, and then it spreads out because these blades are rolling around and, and capping the other uh, otherwise healthy beds. So um, I think we probably also need, we probably need to get our heads together and think of some outside the box solutions like that. That one might not work, but they're. I just think we have to think of, of other things they can do. Just, just sitting on the sidelines and saying we need more water is good, but um, the political, I've become very disheartened with the political situation surrounding Everglades restoration in the past 10 years. So, uh, <clears throat> so just in conclusions, you know, we have these upstream stream areas that are definitely starved for red, fresh water. We're seeing already a decreased size of nursery habitat function due to salinity. Now we also have a loss of habitat there. So as I was mentioning with those, we're already seeing it's been eight years since we've had a good recruitment of spotted sea trout. Now those juveniles also don't have any habitat to go to. So even if you were to get good salinity conditions next year, I'm not sure that the, that the, the fish themselves would come back because they, they rely a lot on those seagrass bats. Um, so we're also seeing these increases in chlorophyll A and SRP, which are cause for concern, but I won't worry about those nearly as much. Um, other than we just need to work now to focus on sources of nutrients and really understand those a little bit better. I don't think there's, a, there's immediate need for action on those. Um, <clears throat> but if there were, the, the, the only thing you can do is just prevent any further increases in nutrient loading by just instituting best management practices, making sure that nobody's in the interest, of, it's not in the interest of anybody to have fertilizers going into the, the ecosystem. So making sure you, you only use what you need. Um, and keeping the monitoring going is essential. As Jim mentioned, we want to understand this die-off that's happening now and the knock-on effects. If we didn't start a good monitoring program back in um, 91 through 95, and then I, what I've seen is we had um, an optimized monitoring program in about 2005 to 2010 where we had a lot of people out in particular in Florida Bay, but I think throughout the South Florida coastal ecosystem doing a lot of really good um, monitoring and good science to, to further our understanding. And since about 2010, that's decreased significantly due to, due to the economic collapse and, and other things, other externalities. But, um, <clears throat> but you can see the, the value of this data to keep it going so that we understand it going into the future. Um, with that, I can take any questions, but I guess we might hold those until later. No, in, in any specific questions, but uh, so we can transition to a discussion um, we do have some time constraints on what we can get done before lunch, and uh, Rhonda has to do her presentation be out of here at a certain time, so we're going to discuss this and we get a motion on the table, fine, but at some point, in about 15 minutes, we're going to have to stop and switch gears, so if we have to finish the discussion uh, after lunch, then we will. Any questions uh, in particular <coughs> for this presentation? Uh, Dave, Vaughn, and then Kelly. <coughs> Sorry, <laughs> caught you off guard. Didn't know where the mic was. <laughs> it was just a Thank you. I enjoyed both of the presentations. It seems obvious that uh, you know salinity is the problem, and we need more fresh water. But now that I see that also the nutrients um, having issues of increasing nutrients of nitrogen, and phosphorus. If we get more fresh water from through the uh, hopefully the in our lifetime restoration of the flow of the Everglades. Um, will there be a dilemma between fresh water versus the nutrients that are coming with it? Jim's smiling because I get to feel that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll have a different answer. <laughs> yeah, I, if they get it right, I mean, if they do what they're supposed to do as far as meet that 10 parts per billion standard before it gets into Everglades National Park, it won't be an issue for the coastal system. Um, but there's also an issue, I think we have to realistically look at it, and we, I, I think John Hunt's talked about this before. 
it, it, it's, it's a realistic trade-off that we've always just said we'll get both things. And I think at this point, the need to act because of the freshwater quantity, we need to ask ourselves how much quality we're willing, degraded quality we're willing to accept to get the quantity that we need. Um, may, may I add? Yeah. Um, so Florida Bay is different than the reef track. So Florida Bay, um, right now the water that enters Florida Bay from up north has much less phosphorus in it than the water that enters Florida Bay from the Gulf of Mexico. So increasing freshwater flow, even at current water quality in the Florida Bay through the Taylor Slough, actually decreases phosphorus loading into the bay because it displaces water that would have come in from tide. So, um, but that's Florida Bay. Now, the reef track is not phosphorus limited, it's nitrogen limited. And what that means then is this, the near shore phosphorus limited systems won't respond to excess nitrogen, which does come in from freshwater runoff from the mainland. Uh, but, and those could have, this is coulds and ifs, right? But those, that nitrogen could have an effect on the reef without ever having an effect close to shore. So we, we do need to worry about nitrogen as well as phosphorus. But for phosphorus in Florida Bay, if that was the only system to, to worry about, putting more fresh water in Florida Bay, even in current water quality, would decrease phosphorus going into the system. Uh, Kelly Schroeder and then Thank you. I was wondering if you could describe how you define baseline from when and from where. Uh, we used the baseline as all that, so we couldn't obviously go back to pre-human times. We just used the data that was collected prior to 2005 for the baseline, and then in areas where we knew there was issues like the central part of Florida Bay, we excluded the data when there was a bloom. <coughs> so it's not bloom baseline conditions. Pete, and then Billy, and then Don, and then Will. So the declining trout recruitment is pretty scary, and there's pretty solid correlations with salinity, but I'm wondering if you address over-harvest as well, because neither the state nor the National Park has addressed your very conclusive data and challenged uh, management or changed management in relation to declining populations. So do you see over-harvest as adding to that declining recruitment? Um, I, I've not looked at that myself. I don't have good estimates of the adult population, which is what you would need to, to know whether changes in the adult population, either due to or harvesting or, or some other mortality term, would affect it. So it, it's something we want to look into. The, the problem is um, we're a little data limited on the adult population. We have the creel survey data, and I'm working with the folks at the at the Fishery Science Center, kind of how to make sense out of that. It's it's a bit of a mystery if you're not a fishery scientist. Yeah. Really? Yes. Uh, this gets to David's point, and then Chris Ray. Uh, I, I really want to stress this: restoration is all inclusive of getting the water right. That's quality, quantity, timing, and distribution. Ecosystem restoration will not be achieved until all four of those elements are met. So the, the popular rumor out there is that we just let the water flow when we want to is absolutely false. The other thing I want to make, uh, Chris, you, you didn't mention pink shrimp. I won't tell Joan, <laughs> yeah. but uh, how are the pink shrimp doing? And then I, I just want one, one figure, and Jim, you may be able to help with this, uh, Jerry. Um, Bill Krasinski used to say that like 80% of our nitrogen and phosphorus comes from the Gulf, or deposition, atmospheric deposition. Is that is that a fair figure? Uh, I would say so for phosphorus. I don't know if I would agree for nitrogen. Uh, depends on where you're where you're looking at too in the system. Um, but yeah, no, there, it's a significant source. 80% just seems high for nitrogen for for phosphorus. It's Jim mentioned very well. In Florida Bay, when you get up north, phosphorus decreases as you get closer to the freshwater runoff sources. So it's definitely not a source there. Uh, the reason I asked about pink shrimp is that a lot of people don't realize they're an annual species and they're a real good indicator of ecosystem health. Yeah. Um, and they, they need a certain amount of fresh water. Yeah, and they, and they, yeah so they've also so shown declines. And anecdotally, when I was out there in July, one of the most amazing things I saw is in that tow where we had 38 
uh, degrees Celsius at the bottom, so it's you know, over 170 uh, parts per thousand. We pulled up a pink shrimp that was pink already. He, he had cooked himself out of the box. <laughs> so if there's ever a site you have a problem, it, it, it would have been that. <laughs> um, let's see, a couple questions actually. Uh, if the sea trout aren't going into that area, they must be going someplace else. Where do they go? I assume it's further south because there's less salinity further south. Um, now that's one question. Yeah. The other one is uh, talk about the Gulf Stream slowing down and an up one. Up one is usually clearer, or usually cooler water and whatnot. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So that the, okay. So let me tackle the first one because okay. they're very different. Um, I don't think they've gone elsewhere because we didn't see, if you if you remember from the graph I showed, we didn't see increases in the western area that was just adjacent to that. So I doubt that there would have been increases in the south area. Um, it, it seems like it's a loss of, of juveniles. It's not the adults, it's, it's the juveniles, the recruits just aren't there. And a lot of the fisheries literature is kind of, and Jerry Alt's a big, a big believer in this as well, points to the, the high recruitment years. In other words, the adult population is driven by a few high recruitment years during the lifespan of the fish. So where for, for to maintain a healthy sea trout population, we would probably want to have a high recruitment every year every three to four years. Going eight years without them is, is really bad. As far as upwelling, so upwelling is on the, on the reefs themselves, right next to the stream. And it does bring colder nutrient rich water from, from the bottom to the top. So from, Onto the onto the bottom of the coral reefs, not not onto the surface waters. Um, <clears throat> so it is it is a little cooler, and in fact, there's uh, one of my coworkers at the lab had put out a paper after uh, I can't remember one of the hurricanes, maybe 2009. One of the hurricanes came over. The corals were getting set up for a bleaching event, and then the hurricane came over, increased upwelling, and actually managed to to stop the bleaching event or, or minimize the bleaching event that would have occurred if that hadn't happened. So there is that, that beneficial effect of it. Well, upwelling's a long way from Fort Mabel. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I meant to point that out. Yeah, it has nothing to do with what's going on in Florida Bay, but on the reef track. Yeah. And, uh, uh, do you guys have any uh, studies or any plans for any studies uh, on the grass down in the lower keys? You show the three times uh, you know, the phosphorus. And I've just noticed a significant change in a lot of the grasses in the basins there. Is there any, can you speak to any of that? I, I, I'll pass that to Jim. I think Jim actually has a yeah. study down there. So um, my laboratory since 95 has run uh, the seagrass monitoring program for the water quality protection program of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. And I don't think that the water quality protection program monitoring groups have, have addressed you guys any kind of recently. So yeah. maybe we can set that up. But we do have a, a we have 40 sentinel sites um, that are spread throughout the Keys uh, from Key West to, to uh, <coughs> uh, and at those 40 sites we're we're actually not seeing uh, signs of increase in nutrients at those sites. Um, but that's only 40 sites. We also have a historical data record of hundreds of uh, ground truth estimates of, of the seagrass community that. It would be nice to, to find money in the future to go back and visit those. So, that, so we have 40 that tell us a whole lot about what's going on at the time at those 40 sites, and then we have a thousand more that, when resampled, will tell us that there's been a kind of decadal slow change. John Hunt, and then Chris. Um, Chris, I'm, I'm, I'm going to follow up on your out of the box comments and sort of speak to the staff. So I know you folks have, have a strong focus here to, to try to do an action item on a broad scale Everglades restoration. But there are opportunities that are more local in nature that I think we need to think about. And I mean, as you folks know, we have a fledgling sponge restoration program going on that is focused on shallow water Florida Bay sponges. There is opportunity there to jumpstart recovery following these types of perturbations. It, removing the seagrass, dead seagrass idea. There are other approaches in the seagrass community 
with interacting with that whole sulfur issue and the interaction between sulfur and iron. Um, in the last go-round event, um, Brian Keller, when he was working for the Nature Conservancy and, and living in my office, and I were writing a series of, of uh, uh, little, small little booklets on various topics to try to explain some of these topics in a, to, to a non-science uh, community, and we had one called Rust and Rotten Eggs, which was about that whole sulfur-iron interaction. And some scientists now, and Jim in particular, are proposing trying to do, you know, explore some of those areas in a restoration context by being able to jumpstart the recovery of seagrasses. And so I would encourage you folks, as you do your conversations, to, you know, think about where this kind of action can come into place and encourage those organizations, and in this case it would be in particular the National Park Service, whose policies sometimes make this kind of restoration activity more, you know, fairly difficult. And so I, I would suggest that you consider these kinds of, of, of thoughts as you do your, your uh, deliberations. Uh, not to dissuade you from water management, but to encourage you to think beyond water management because there's opportunity in this situation since we know so much, because what you heard from Jim and really what you heard from Chris uh, is the scenarios are repeating themselves. The same kinds of recruitment problems happen with sea trout happened previously. The same kinds of die-offs, the causes are all the same. We have some capacity to, to perhaps jumpstart the recovery if we're allowed to. Um, and instead of having a 25-year cycle, maybe we have a 10-year cycle. And then when water management kicks in, you're already on your way. So I'm encouraging you to think beyond water management as you do your deliberations. Chris, and then we'll have to let Rhonda start. So uh, this is a question about uh, terminology, and it's not about scientific terminology or any of those great acronyms that you showed us, but you know, we've heard several times today the concept that the bay died, the bay is dead, they could die again. And, um, and I think that there's been some interesting perceptions of this problem that we're facing right now playing out in the media uh, here locally. And I think Tim uh, from the USA has left already, so who knows what's going to be in the paper tomorrow. <laughs> um, but I guess, I guess this is a word of caution. Probably never will. <laughs> <laughs> it's a word of caution about that particular phrase. My, my, I guess I'll ask you in, in a question, but you know, do ecosystems die? Um, we know we know that fishing charter reservations die, and, and fishing businesses and bird watching trips uh, reservations die. Um, do ecosystems die? What happens when this happens? When this? So up? I would say ecosystems do die. I would, but this isn't that case. I mean, it's uh, it's changing beyond what what we had previously. Well, in this case, it's repeating what we've previously seen, possibly. But what we know from what we've previously seen, and I don't know how to proper terminology is, is it's moving into an extremely undesirable state, both for ecology and for the human society and the human population that depends on the bay. Here, here. Yeah. Can, can I can I say that too? Maybe. Um, <laughs> actually, slightly different ecosystems. Depending on how you define them, they don't die; they change. Yeah. So what's uh, what's happening is the values that we that humans derive from the Florida Bay ecosystem are the uh, the cultural aspects, the artistic aspects, the fisheries aspects, the, the economic engine. Those services are changing because the system is changing into something different that probably actually has higher net primary production. Right? It's probably actually more productive now for, in terms of the atmosphere and, and CO2 cycling of the atmosphere 
So that value is probably increasing because of our changes. But what we care about are those values that are produced by the structure that the ecosystem was in when, um, when, when I was going to say when white man first got to these keys, but that's culturally incorrect. Uh, <laughs> let, let's say um, 5,000 years ago when the Florida Bay flooded. Right? So, so the ecosystem's not dead. It's probably more biologically active under conditions of seagrass die-off than it is when there's seagrass there. It's just different, and the values that we uh, hold dear are no longer being produced. Mr. Chair, can I add to that one sentence? One sentence. One sentence. Yeah. Florida Bay as we know it is done. <laughs> <laughs> Just drop it, Jerry. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, we're just going to have to put our uh, motion on hold and it will be good to talk about it. I certainly appreciate your comments, John, and I think we do need to think about that. But at this point, I'd like to shift gears and let uh, Rhonda uh, do a presentation on canal restoration, and then we'll break for lunch. Good morning. I'm Rhonda Hay with Monroe mm -hmm. County. Got to be this. Mm -hmm. Got to talk and walk at the same time. Okay, so I'm talking. Is it on? Yep. Yes. Very good. I'm going to talk to you today about the Monroe County Canal Restoration Program, which has been active for the last four years. Maybe not. Okay, so what happened was, you know, 50, 60 years ago, the Florida Keys were created, um, the, not the Florida Keys, but the developed places of the Florida Keys were created when 175 miles of canals with 312 miles of waterfront property were here. So what happened was, as you can see, of course, if we were all around back then when they were going through this, it would be entirely different because we wouldn't have made the decisions. But you can see they have a lot of canals here that were dug and they didn't connect to the other side. And so we have a lot of canals where you were, which is creating the problems today. Uh, many were canals were dug 10 to 20 feet deep to maximize fill material. And actually up in, in certain parts of the Keys, like in Key Largo, they were up to 40 feet deep, really, really deep. And most are long, dead-end networks with little or no tidal flushing, as we all well know. And finally, of course, as I already said, if we have, we're all here today, and when they dug these canals many years ago, the canal system either wouldn't be here or would look very, very different. But we're stuck with what we had, and so what we wanted to do, I guess it took us 50 years to get to the point where we realized there was a problem, but that's really what the um, canal restoration program is about. It's how to address some of these issues. So we had an increased population growth once we settled the Keys and put roads in. Of course, people came here and you didn't have storm water and wastewater systems. And so as you all know, we are just wrapping up, we're proud to say we're wrapping up the installation of the um, wastewater systems in the Keys, and that's why we're now looking forward to the canal restoration. We added excessive nutrients, turbidity, and, sed and sediment to the canal waters, causing long-term water quality degradation. And we also destroy the shoreline habitat while we're digging all these canals, especially the mangroves. And finally, these canals do discharge directly to the outstanding Florida waters, uh, which may or may not receive direct discharges. So overall, we have a system here, lots of different um, broken pieces here and there, and lots of different restoration techniques, which we're going to talk about. So we created um, a canal restoration advisory subcommittee to deal with canal restoration directly. And that includes many different members, <coughs> EPA, NOAA, and the federal, state, DEP, Fish and Wildlife, County, our commissioner, Mr. Commissioner Nugent. Um, all five cities in the Keys are represented. Um, others like the Florida Keys Environmental Fund, of course, Charlie Causey, and myself and staff are um, advisors. So that's our subcommittee, the Canal Restoration Advisory Subcommittee. And the first recommendation was well, before you know how to move forward, you have to identify what your problems are. So, there, so we agreed to go forward with the canal management master plan. And under that, we were going to determine what the goals for canal water quality improvement were, develop kind of a framework so we know how to move forward and could identify what the problems were, and then complete a comprehensive countywide mapping of residential canals, and finally, a field study of water quality in the canals. So we had to know where the canals were and what the problems were with each individual canal. And we looked at 502 canals. 
And we developed a ranking system for categorizing these canals based on observed character characteristics. And remember, the main thing that we were looking at is levels of dissolved oxygen. And prioritized canals were based on the need for water quality improvement and the potential for corrective actions and management practices. And I'll get a little bit more into this in a little bit. So phase one of our canal management was funded by DEP back in March 2012. That was just to develop a basic framework. And then phase two was funded by EPA um, quite a year later, and that's where we are actually able to do the final assessment where we knew we had 502 residential canals and we completed a ranking and prioritization. Now we didn't rank all 502. <coughs> what we did was we divided them into categories. So we knew we had 502 in total, and then we divided them into the worst of the worst, which we call poor, and then fair, and then good. The good ones were actually ones that met state water quality standards. Uh oh. Okay. And so, as I said, 311 were identified as either poor or fair. So less than half of the canals met state water quality standards in terms of levels of oxygen in the water. And see, there's some of the worst examples, and we'll get to those in a minute. So why do we need canal restoration? Well, these are the beautiful canals. This is what we like to see canals look like in the Florida Keys. Key Colony Beach, you can congratulate yourself all your all your, all your canals are good. Duck Key, similar. Beautiful canals all meet water quality standards. Key Haven, also very good canals. Good flow through. That one is Comp Key. And finally, Sugarloaf. All beautiful canals, this is what we like to see. Unfortunately, we have the opposite. The two-thirds that don't meet state water quality standards. Yuck. Upper Keys, accumulated seaweed. Yuck. Middle Keys, trap seaweed. If you live in one of these canals, you know what I'm talking about. Very poor, trap seaweed again. Very poor, lack of flushing. So you can see these aren't the beautiful canals. And what happens is, not only are they too deep, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, but depending on how they were built and the wind that comes in, you get a lot of seaweed that blows in, sinks to the bottom, get a lot of many feet of um, accumulated organic material on the bottom. So this is why we are looking at a canal management master plan and canal restoration program in the Keys. People that live on these canals don't have the full benefit of beautiful um, and water that meets state water quality standards. So what we did was with the canal management master plan, we looked at different restoration techniques to improve the water quality related Remember, We're only talking dissolved oxygen. Don't confuse us with the wastewater treatment where you're looking at nutrients. We are only about dissolved oxygen. Doesn't mean that the others aren't important. Okay, and so here's some just different examples of technologies. There's five. There's removal of the accumulated organics from within canal. Basically, you're digging out the muck by vacuum dredge. You're looking at weed gates and air curtains, physical barriers to keep the seaweed out from blowing in. You're looking at culvert connections. Remember you had those canals that were all dead end here, so what you're doing is you're connecting them to another body of water, whether it's an open water or another canal. Backfilling, remember those 40 feet deep canals I told you about in Key Largo? Well, those are, back, those are potential for backfilling. And then finally a pumping system where you have a canal where Maybe we don't have another restoration technique, but you're just increasing the circulation of the water within the canal itself. And what that's supposed to do is increase the levels of dissolved oxygen. So we recommended that the first implement, so we, rather than jumping forward with the full um, restoration program, we wanted to try out some of the techniques. So we came up with the demonstration program. And we came up with these five different um, trends that you heard me talking about. I'm going to get into this. And so what we did was we decided to set them up and test them to evaluate the effectiveness of each of them in terms of restoring water quality, not only when we first did the project, for, for, but for a two-year period afterwards that we would monitor the water quality to see if that restoration technique did indeed work in the long term. And that was also to obtain realistic permitting, scheduling, and cost information. We learned an awful lot during that, too. And we learned a lot why homeowners that had went forward with their own programs previously kind of dropped out in the process because they just couldn't get through the permitting process. It was, it was much too difficult for homeowners on their own. 
And so what we're hoping by doing this demonstration program is to pave the way for these home lines that want to do theirs on their own without waiting for um, county to do it is they'll now be able to go forward with um, these permits in a much faster manner and, act and actually have good cost information. So we initially funded $5 million for the demonstration project and we actually added in this fiscal year, we added $2 million more. In the village of Isla Mirada, our friends to the north, also funded $100,000 and already has completed their first demonstration project. So here's kind of the um, types. You have the weed barriers, the organic removal, culvert, backfilling, and pumping. And the ones, I'll get through them, but we're already in organic removal, culvert installation, and backfilling. We're already in the midst of those. Pumping, talk to you a little bit later about that, and then of course the weed barriers. So these are just the original list, and we expanded it a little bit beyond five um, because we thought we had enough money to do them all, but that turned out to be not quite true. So this is our first demonstration project, the 40-foot deep canal in Key Largo. Extremely deep, it was actually up to 40 feet deep, and they had pockets of low dissolved oxygen, obviously, and when the divers went down there to do their surveys, they actually found very high hydrogen sulfide um, down here, he actually had to get out of there so he wouldn't poison himself. But these type of things can be flushed out to the near shore waters during storm events. And restoration, restoration consisted of placing 900 truckloads of clean fill to raise a canal elevation from minus 30 feet to minus 7. And of course that is the, bit, the most optimum um, flushing for the tidal flushing. We wanted to put it at the optimal level which is why it's at minus 7.7. And what we did was we brought in, I have a little video of this, we brought in 10 to 20 truckloads a day. Remember, we're in a very tight neighborhood with small, narrow streets, and we're bringing in 10 to 20 truckloads of fill every day from Florida City. And I have to hand it to the homeowners. They were really very patient with us. Um, but Adventure Environmental was selected, 1.36 million. That's one canal. And we picked a really small canal because we didn't want to spend a lot of money. We wanted to spend to spread a rough the rest of the money were over the other demonstration, but this is just to tell you how expensive just one canal is for backfilling. Very expensive. Excavator. So we had 20 20 books done. We loaded it into a homeowner's yard. We dumped them into a yard, and then we took it by a conveyor belt out into the middle of the canal and then placed it along the thing. So we moved it onto a barge. I think I have a little video here in the next one. So the project events were ongoing maintenance of turbidity curtains. We actually had three turbidity curtains to kind of control the turbidity. Somehow crocodiles and manatees managed to find a way in anyway. So every, every time we had, to, we had to swim the canal to make sure that there was no animals there when we were doing our work. And the homeowners actually said the construction was much less disruptive than what they had anticipated. So there you have the three turbidity barriers. There you have on the bottom, you can see it, it was it was a good, it was a really good project. Construction started March 2015. Uh, we removed the muck removal. We re actually replaced a six inch layer of sand fill, actually I guess a minimum of one foot in May, um, so that we could encourage seagrass to restore, to restore growth there. And the project was completed in July. So a really good project. Remember, over a million dollars. And I have a little bit of a video here. Um, this 90 day post backfill mm -hmm. survey. So what we had was once we placed the sand on the bottom, we had to go back 90 days later to make sure that we didn't have pockets that settled. We were actually very lucky we didn't, so we were able to close that out. And we're actually going to close out right now. But you can see the turbidity right there in the far right corner, and you see the you see on the bar here. But I have just a little bit video video, video here <coughs> from a drone. <coughs> You can see him in the middle of the canal. Obviously, you can see the difference in the canal. There you go. He's pushing the fill material in. It's went on for three months. We had, luckily, we had one homeowner yard that was empty, so we didn't have to use um, neighbors' driveways in the street. If we didn't have that one vacant lot, it would have been a much more difficult project. But those are some of the types of things we learned um, doing these. It's There's not always... Um, empty lots available and we didn't want to use the barging method number one the sanctuary had advised us not to and number two it costs a lot more money when you're barging fill in rather than trucking it in so we got lucky with this one there you can see right down in the middle there there's the barge putting it in just an excellent excellent project there you go 
So this went on for three months. Like I said, the homeowners were very, very pleased with the progress and it was, wasn't that actually detrimental to their thing. And so what happened was the benefits, immediate, was um, beyond belief. Immediately we saw the return of sea life. I'll, say, I'll get you a quote here. Um, we're hoping to, for the, course, the return of sea grasses. Dissolved oxygen impairment immediately went up. Sea grasses started to come back. This we got received lots of homeowner emails. I mean, immediately after the project was done, we're seeing the canal is coming alive. We've been seeing the mullet, the snapper, the jacks, manatees over the past month. Today, another milestone. They heard a commotion in the canal and looked out to see a school of snapper chasing a shrimp. The shrimp was jumping for all it's worth, trying to get away. But obviously, he didn't make it. The snapper finally ate it. This all happened in broad light daylight. This was within just a month after we finished completion of the canal restoration. So very, very happy homeowners. Immediate return of sea life to this canal that was formerly one of our worst in the county. Remember, it was 40 feet deep, no oxygen, nothing. And here we are a month or two later, and we already have all the fish coming back. And there's another one. You can see the bottom and all over. You can see the bottom. Remember, it was 40 feet deep before. All kinds of uh, fish and snappers. So very, very happy homeowners. Another one. We've noticed lots of fish, big and small. The manatees are coming back. Six of them showed up just about every day. So very, very successful project. That was our Key Largo backfilling project. Next one. On to the muck removal. So there's two muck removal canals. We started with the first one called 266 in Doctor's Arm in Big Pine Key. Probably all very familiar with the canals on Big Pine Key. A lot of them, they're faced toward the wind. When the wind blows in, see the um, seagrass sinks and you got a lot of muck. This one had up to five feet of muck. I'm five eight, so five feet is this much. Obviously gonna no dissolved oxygen in there. And of course, some of our canals on Big Pine Key are the worst in the entire county. This was a bad one. So what the restoration consisted of removal of the five feet of muck from the canal bottom. Um, in this particular one, our two demonstration projects, we are not backfilling. So e, we are digging down to the coral rock and not backfilling, and we're testing these to see actually how well organic removal on its own um, will be effective in terms of restoring water quality and in the long term. Because if we have to backfill, so first of all, if we remove the organic removal, and I believe this one goes down to about 13 or 14 feet, and then you backfill it up to the optimum length, a level of seven to eight feet, that obviously costs more money. It basically doubles your cost. So we wanted to try out these two demonstration projects to see how well backfilling all on its own without the second phase of um, backfilling um, occurred. So that's what we're doing with these two demonstration projects. So we constructed, a, we selected a contractor, J.N.D. Thomas, that first canal alone, another very expensive one, 1.2 million, only for the muck removal, no backfilling. Um, so that's a high, so there's no clam shells here. This is all hydraulic vacuum dredge to protect the um, the environment. The dredge spoils were piped to a landside landside staging area. I'll get a little um, video in a moment. The spoils were dewatered mechanically. You'll see that in a second, and the water discharged back into the canal. So it was a really it looked like a little city out there, but this is how we you know we to vacuum dredge the muck, we had removed the water so that we would have the uh, leftover muck. And here you can see, it's actually very good material. Unfortunately, it has a lot of salt, so we can't use it for our gardens, but we do have something in mind for the future, which I'll get into. And we had to add polymers to assist in the dewatering process. So we brought in the water, we brought them into big tanks, added the polymers, waited for the settlement to occur, and then pumped out the water. Quite the process, I have to tie it. And the reuse of dredge spoils at a local facility. So what they can do, even though it does have salt, and you can reuse them if you dilute them with regular fill, you can use them for certain types of um, construction. There was a Commissioner Nugent there during our site visit. So we had good coordination with the sewer installation work. They were uh, working there at the same time. No manatees or key deer within the project footprint. And we did have a bit of an issue uh, with the um, muck removal. We had a five foot buffer that the contractor originally identify it. So if you're looking at a 30-foot canal and you have a five-foot buffer zone on each side, they didn't want to get too close to the walls because they were worried about hurting um, 
uh, sea walls or, or walls crumbling in. So we had originally agreed to not go within that five foot buffer zone, but then that left up to one third of the muck still in the canal. So if you have a 30 foot wide canal and you have five feet on each side, that's 10 feet of muck still in the canal. Well, I don't call that a complete restoration. And so we worked with the contractor very closely and they were able to use a different method, um, kind of like a hand method where they were able to get in there and remove actually most of the muck within the five foot buffer zone also. So they didn't use the big mechanic, the big um, vacuum dredge, they used more of like an individual watering jetting method to able to get in there. And that's why it did take extra time, but in the end, it turned out really well. So the project schedule started in May. We're not done quite yet. Been a little bit of a delay, but everything was going well. Survey um, removal to minus three inches, so nearly all of the muck in the canal has been surveyed and shown that it's removed. So where we are right now, you can see where the water is discharged. Um, we actually today, we had a little bit of a delay, but actually today we bet we're started on the final phase where we're going to place six inches of sand in the canal to encourage the seagrass growth. And that's today. We have about three weeks of work, and then that'll be done. And then we're going to put a weed gate. And here's just a real quick drone video of this one. <clears throat> there you go. This is where they're directing the barge, where they're taking up the uh, normal seat on the bottom there. Yep, there you go. So get down there. they got to get up the uh, organic removal and, and pipe all the water over to their equipment on the... Uh, on the shore over there. And there's different types of dewatering methods. This one was um, involved, we were originally looked at biotubes, but we left it open when we put the solicitation out. We left it, you can see there, the, the, um, and there to the right is where all the equipment is, the shakers and the polymer settlers. It was it looks like a little city out there. But we left it open to the vendors because we wanted to see, you know, what different types of ideas were out there. And this you can see a very large footprint. So this would be difficult. We were lucky there because we did have room, but this would be difficult again on a canal that didn't have an empty lot in it because this is a this is a lot of equipment. So we're looking at different types of dewatering for our next one which could include biotubes or even, even different types of methods. But there you go, you see the final product coming out at the end. And again, very nice, um, rich product, too salty for, uh, for uh, garden use. This is just the conveyor belts. And there you go. What's the cost of this product? This one was 1.2. 1. <coughs> 1.2. Yeah, 1.2 million, just one canal. And there's the pretty water at the end. All right. Let's move on. And so we did, um, actually a lot of people of course were interested in these projects, we hadn't done it before, so we organized an outreach tour based on another EPA, thank you EPA for our outreach grant. We had, um, it was in August, middle of August, this was to the muck removal project. We had over 50 people attended, they were very, very pleased with what they saw, learned a lot, um, learned um, the complications that arise when we're doing these demonstration projects. And we talked a little bit about the management master plan, the site tour of the dewater equipment, that of course was the most popular, the dredging operation, then a little question and answer. But very, very popular. Great feedback. And then finally, um, the second canal, we're about to start on that. We've already mobilized, like I said, we're wrapping up the first canal, number 266. The second canal is out over on Avenue J, still on Big Pine Key. We already mobilized and we're about to begin um, the organic removal on that. Same type of system, same contractor. We bid out that um, project in one bid and the contractor responded that he could do both, so we're about to move forward with that. Little smaller canal, this one's about 800,000. Not quite five feet, so we're removing about four feet of muck. Um, again, JND Thomas, and because we bid the two projects together, they didn't have to have separate contractors or separate mobilizations, so we saved about $200,000 by combining them together. Same type of things, except number canal number 290 does have a little bit of elevated arsenic and copper levels, and because of that, now we're not able to use that for any type of um, construction material, even when you dilute it with clean spoils, so that is going to be taking, unfortunately, to a dump up in Miami-Dade County because of the arsenic and copper levels. And there's just a little bit of the project site right there. Project schedule, we've already just began mobilization. We expect to be completed in late February. 
and then we're going to also add a weed barrier there to make sure that we keep all of the weeds because a big pine key that's the biggest problem you can't just remove the muck you got to make sure you keep out the seaweed from the future and that's of course we're going to place that weed gate all right so now looking at um, some air curtains basically they're big bubblers where you bubble up the air from the bottom to keep out the um, seaweed <coughs> We're looking at 287, this is Atlantic at States, Big Pine Key. Um, we're looking at three different types of demonstration projects. We're going to do an air curtain alone in Atlantic at States. We're going to do one combined with our muck removal, the doctor's arm canal. Once we're done removing that muck, we're going to install a weed gate. And finally, one with aerators, that's what Isla Marana did, and theirs was very successful. And these are kind of what they look like. You put the big disc on the bottom of the canal and it just blows up bubbling air. So it doesn't keep out all of the seagrass. When we have, the, of course, the big winds, the really big winds or hurricanes, it's not going to be able to overflow, overcome that, but it does keep out the majority. And people like them because there's no navigational impediment you know, you can drive through the air bubbles. That's the problems with the weed gates that you open and close, even though they can keep out more of the weeds, you have that navigation um, issue. So everybody likes the, uh, the uh, bubblers. Culverts? Very, very popular. We can get a lot done for less money on culverts. So what culverts does is just increase your tidal flushing by connecting a uh, dead-end canal either to an open body of water or another um, canal that does get better flushing. First one on Boca Chica Shores. <coughs> of course, when you, anytime you're dealing with the federal government, that slows down, so we kind of push that to the back burner. Um, Tropical Bay Estates, we're about to move forward on Big Pine Key. We got another grant from DEP, thank you, to fund $50,000 of the construction costs. That overall estimate is $400,000. Um, it's going to be a 60 foot, 5 inch, 5 foot circular reinforced pipe. And they're underwater, and they're going to connect two, <coughs> connect two segments of the canal. I don't know, we're making sure we're paying attention there. We already applied for the permits. We are um, having some issues getting them finalized, but. Uh, we're working on it, and uh, we already have it out for, for RFP, and hopefully we'll get the permit issues um, taken care of. The problem is we had some mangrove, um, red mangrove issues that we're working through. So we hope to start that in March, and it can be complete by June, and there you go, that's the day up. And also then canal number 472 on Geiger Key, that's next, I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about that. So we already did the Geiger Key culvert that was funded by DEP, they helped with the um, design and construction. This was a little bit smaller. Um, it was designed, again, you can see the road there, it was just designed to put a culvert under the road to increase circulation between the bay side and the ocean side and bay side. Charlie Tapino, it's a smaller one, this is only 24 inch, 24 inch by 38 inch. We were somewhat constricted because of there were, I think there were some sewer lines there, so we had to use a smaller culvert. So what happened was, while we were putting it in under the road, um, they noticed that on one side there was some homeowner seawall there, there were obstructions. And so instead of putting the culvert in directly straight through under the road, they angled it to get away from the obstruction that was there. And, they, um, and what happened was now the culvert was coming out on an angle <coughs> against the homeowner's property. And so the homeowners were kind of worried. Let me just do a... There you can see putting it in. I want to show you the deflector plate. So what happened was, since it was coming in at an angle, the homeowner here was worried that his seawall was going to be undermined with the water flow. So we put a deflector plate here um, to, get, to deflect the water back towards the middle of the culvert. So what happened was, and I mean immediately, when we installed the culvert, FIU of course was doing the water quality monitoring, but an immediate improvement of the dissolved oxygen levels. The day we opened it, water quality jumped. And we had it open for not too long of a period, about three, couple of months. And immediately we saw a big increase in the levels of oxygen. But what happened was, this was a heavy, this was a season of heavy um, seaweed accumulation. And what happened was we had a lot of winds that blew in the seaweed. And the culvert did create a little bit of an eddy at the end. And so the homeowners were blaming all of the seaweed, the, the, the um, the seaweed accumulation, they were blaming it on the culvert. They didn't understand that it was a summer of heavy seaweed all over the world. And of course they got complained and they, were, they had pretty heavy sea load levels, especially at the end. 
and so the county closed the culvert three months later. And what happened was when we, when we closed it, immediately the levels of dissolved oxygen went back down. So it was a very good um, demonstration project to show what happens when you have a culvert, open and close, and it remains closed right now, and we're actually ongoing, we're gonna evaluate what to do, whether we want it, when we, we are going to open it back up, but it's decided, are we gonna um, put it back towards the middle of the canal, or are we gonna do some other measures, but that's to remain, remain to be determined. But very successful project, beautiful water when it was open, beautiful. And finally, the Eden Pines, this is the last one, the Eden Pines, again on Big Pine Key. This one was where you have that, oh, Billy knows, Billy Cosy knows have a very long and winding canal system, no connection anywhere, just very, very, probably one of the poorest water quality canals in all of the Keys, and it's just awful. And it's, it's hard to do anything with that canal um, because it is so long and winding and has so many different figures, so what we thought this might be was, might be a good use of pumps where we pump the water um, to, our original thing, we were gonna pump the water over one end and into the, um, um, the uh, not the sanctuary, but the refuge. Uh, yeah, the refuge. That didn't go over well with the refuge. They didn't want the canal water coming over and into the refuge. So not we we are now looking at is just circulating it internally. And we haven't done the design on this one. We've been busy getting the other ones ready. So here you see the the uh, pumps that would be used to do that. Very complex project. High operation and maintenance costs. Because they're such big pumps and because they're pumping so much water, you're looking at twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars a year in electric electric costs. And so that's a lot of money. Even though there's 450 homeowners out there, that's still a lot of money. Um, we need a mechanism, and we haven't gotten to the point in the county where we know how we're going to fund these type of projects and especially the operations and maintenance. And we need approvals of over 450 <coughs> property owners, which we don't have yet. And of course, the refuge hooks um, <coughs> me back up. So, those are some of the problems. We have placed this a little bit on hold while we're doing all the uh, rest of the demonstration projects. We haven't forgotten them. We're actually looking at maybe some of the other um, techniques that we might be able to use. And so, finally, FIU, of course, is doing the water quality monitoring. I don't need to get into that. But they've been doing it a year ahead of time before we started the project and will continue for a period of two years after. <coughs> and they're measuring. You can talk to them if you want to over there and measure all kind of good stuff. <coughs> and you heard about all this today. So anyway, and then they're also not, they're also doing the benthic monitoring, monitoring also. And finally, our Font Canal grant this year from EPA. So you heard about the five demonstration projects and you heard how expensive they are, especially the organic removal and the backfilling. So now we want to look at and also the operations and monitoring. So now with this canal grant, we're going to look at different types of um, cheaper projects or cheap, cheaper technologies. And one of them is going to, remember I told you we have that beautiful muck that we're taking out of the canals, but we can't use it for gardens and composting because it has a high salt content. So we're going to look at what amount of flushing is necessary to remove the salts that we can use it for organic, um, for gardens and, and uh, composting so that we can put it in bags like that and sell it to you. And we're looking at different technologies to address accumulated muck in the bottom. There's a lot of different types of bio things out there, bugs and clams and all kinds of things that we can look at that um, are different ways to address the accumulated muck in the canal bottom. So it doesn't all have to be done by expensive organic removal by the uh, vacuum dredge. Uh, so we're going to look at those different technologies. We're also going to look at different technologies for just increasing the overall water quality improvements. And finally, you know, technologies that were included in the demonstration program, passive and less energy intensive and cheaper. So we want to do that as the next phase. And finally, we're going to do a development of a business plan. So we know we need to do a canal restoration program in here. We kind of jumped into the demonstration program, but didn't come up with an overall um, plan yet for how to move forward and how to pay for it, how to fund operations and, ma and maintenance, and how to fund the um, actual projects themselves. So that's kind of what this is going to be. So the future, our commissioners have requested a public workshop. We're kind of at that point now where we've got the demonstration projects well underway but we don't know how we're going to move forward or whether we are going to move forward. So they requested a workshop to discuss the programmatic plan for whether we are going to move forward with the Monroe County Canal Restoration Program. So the restoration you heard, there's needed for 229 canals and that's only in unincorporated Monroe County. That doesn't include the ones in the city. So out of the total 502 in the, in the county overall with the cities, 300 need restoration and that includes the incorporated cities. 
um, discussion of the regulatory requirements. So there is this issue here, what if we don't do the restoration program? What does that mean to the county? That's where EPA and DEP come in because they need to explain to the counties, commissioners, and staff what happens if we don't do it. Are we required by law to do that? Are we going to be placed in a TMDL situation? Those are the types of things that we're going to discuss at this public workshop. And it's going to be a clarification of their mandates. Are we mandated or are we not mandated? I don't think uh, we've clarified that yet. So we're going to need, obviously, EPA and DEP at this workshop to help us. And then finally, it's like, how are we going to pay for it? So we know we got all this funding, and we just got all this funding done, and we did the big billion-dollar sewer um, program. Well, now we have a several hundred million dollar canal restoration program and we need to figure out how we're going to pay for it. And finally, um, so that canal workshop, we haven't set the date yet, but we are looking, anticipating sometime in March, of course, depending on availability of our DEP and EPA partners. And that is the, what a beautiful canal should look like and why we're here. And just a real quick sales job for our EPA, DEP and EPA partners. We have received a lot of money. They funded 100,000 for phase one, EPA funded phase two. That helped us kick off our $5 million program. So if it hadn't been for those original grants from DEP and EPA, I might not be standing up here today talking about our restoration program. They continue to fund us. They perform um, bathymetric surveys. Um, they help perform, help provide uh, the culvert design and permitting. Again, lately, they funded the Geiger Key design and construction. Uh, we're doing now two environmental education programs, um, and finally we're doing that um, program where we're, just, where we're looking at different types of technologies that we can use beyond the five demonstration projects. And DEP is also looking at funding us this year for 50000 for one of the culverts. And so you kind of see it's been a partnership. So they helped us get going with the, with the federal and state grants, and then the county was able to kick in the five, now seven million to keep this program going, but we're at a juncture right now where we need to determine where are we going with whole canal program, with this whole canal program. And that's it. Thank you for your time. Hi, Ron. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I may have missed this. It was a, I know this will vary depending on the size of the canal, but for all the fill, it was a little over 1.2 million. It was about uh, 800,000 or a million to suction dredge. What was the culvert? <clears throat> I would say 400,000. Okay. Yeah. And obviously that we thought requires that a canal on both sides. Um, or open water. Yeah. yeah and, and the ability to do that. So. Um, Another four hundred million dollars, and we can get all the rest of the canals done, right? So that's great. Mm -hmm. That's why we need everybody's help to keep this program moving. Any other questions? A, a comment, a comment for Ben. Um, I, I just want to say, Ben, uh, there are a lot of culverts that have been put in place over the years. Sure. And if you go over it, was it not Jolly Roger? What is it in, uh, on Little Porch? If you, those subdivisions there, you'll see. Huge man, and I'm not exaggerating. Big mangroves and parrotfish. It's they're healthy again, just under some of those culverts. Coincidentally, we did a fair bit of suction dredging on the aquarium project that I'm a part of, and um, did that privately within ourselves. And and we see huge, huge changes in the marine life and what that system can support now. And it uses weed gates and aeration in conjunction. And we had uh, we removed approximately. 4,000 cubic yards of muck, and um, we're using aeration and weed gates now, and, and we're supporting a tremendous amount of marine life at the uh, at the aquarium. And if that's something that you guys wanted to look at at all, you'd be Thank welcome you. to see it. Thank you. Just kind of an update also, we are um, probably heard of the Florida Keys Environmental Stewardship Bill. I can't say the word environmental, it's just not Florida Keys Stewardship Bill current bill up in Tallahassee that we're sponsoring, maybe <coughs> Nugent wants to talk about it, but it's for $220 million, George? Uh, two, uh, two, 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 yeah. yeah, it's to fund um, land acquisition and water quality projects in the Keys, so hopefully that will pass this year and we'll have at least a partial funding mechanism for projects like this. Great presentation, I think it's a really important 
appropriate, and I know it's, um, it's a lot to handle. Um, as Ben pointed out, it's expensive. Um, so was and so is uh, the wastewater management, but I think it's worth yes. worth every penny. Whether or not we're obligated to do it by the EPA, the EP, and so on, I think it's the right thing to do. And um, uh, I wonder if, if you have an opportunity. Maybe it, it, maybe the opportunity is this upcoming canal workshop, just to sort of you know put it out to the community. What are your ideas? What are the other innovative ideas that people can come up with? I know there's been a lot of really positive. Um, creative thinking, but um, the more the merrier. Yes. Maybe during that workshop, uh, you can challenge the community to come up with even more and cheaper, hopefully cheaper ideas. Mm -hmm. I think that would be fruitful. Excellent idea. And we um, do actually have, oh, we do have people that show up at our um, regular canal meetings that we host, um, and vendors and things like that that are interested in us use, testing their methods. So we are looking at those for the next phase of this restoration program. Great. And I just wanted to say, you mentioned that the EPA has funded a lot of this. Obviously, it was Monroe County's initiative to want to do the work. Uh, but the EPA, and the reason that the EPA is focused on the Florida Keys is that they're obligated to by Congress as a part of the establishment of the Keys Marine Sanctuary. So there's a lot of talk from time to time about how the sanctuary doesn't give anything back, it doesn't bring anything to this community. And that's a specific monetary example of how that's not true. Exactly. <laughs> Um, EPA and DEP certainly have been partners in this, but just like the sewer project, yeah. they're distant partners <laughs> as far as the money uh, that comes in. And we're going to be searching out, like we did with the wastewater project that's been going on for 20 years, for additional dollars. Uh, just to clarify things, our residents put up, and either through the infrastructure sales tax money, are through contributions by the residents in the system development fees that we charge the large amount of this money. We're still waiting on a 50, uh, 500 million, no, it was 100 million dollars, right, about 50 million dollars uh, over 20 years from the feds who said they were going to stand beside us uh, shoulder to shoulder. Um, and without Governor Scott putting up uh, 100 million dollars over the last couple of sessions, uh, which is more than the federal government and the state government prior to that has put into this project. So um, I'm not trying to speak negatively about the contributions that the federal uh, uh, government has put into this and the state, but it's been a long term time coming and we'd like to see them step up to the plate a little bit more. We were, we're also looking at Restore Act money um, the, from the BP tragedy that took place to help fund uh, this project. George, I'm with you. So, um, uh, question, Ron, yes. it actually kind of follows along the same line of discussion, but um, uh, um, as you've gotten a couple of these kind of under your belt, uh, is there going to be, uh, or could you incorporate in kind of the next steps, sort of a socioeconomic look? And any changes in property value with having a cleaned up canal in front of it or adjacent to it or nearby as, a, as opposed to? That's at the top of my list. Oh, Actually, we heard from realtors even before we did the projects and homeowners. They begged us to do these canals, restorations, especially the ones on Big Pine Key. We had people that live on these canals that you saw that were restoring that couldn't rent their homes out <coughs> because the water smelled so bad and looked so bad. They couldn't rent them out. They couldn't sell them for what they thought the value should be. So we are expecting a rather dramatic increase in the value of at least the ones on Big Pine Key, hopefully the ones on Key Largo and all the rest of them too. And that's part of the economic benefit. So their values will jump. So they might be paying some, but I think they're going to more than see it back in the economic increase in the home. And yes, it is part of my overall plan to monitor that because increase in homeowner means increase in taxes. Price. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I just, uh, George, I, I want, I just want to say that you, you, you won't get any argument from from us uh, in regard to what you just there said. Is no there is no argument. There is no argument. I will say, I will say that we we appreciate what the county has done. We appreciate what Governor Scott has done uh, with the hundred million that the state has brought to the wastewater projects of recent and. Uh, Again, I think this is uh, one of the ways that this place, which was actually going downhill 
in the 80s and 90s, long before the sanctuary was, was, was designated. What we need to do and continue to do, that I think we do very effectively, is use this sanctuary as leverage. It's, it, everyone sees it as a federal entity or a state entity, a co-trustee arrangement, when in fact it's our sanctuary and it's in our place. And, and I think it's been the taxpayers that have stepped up at the urging of the county in many instances and have helped restore this area to back what we remember it was like. So I just think if we continue to work in partnership that we will attract, someday those federal dollars may come, I don't know. I can't make any promises, but, but we will keep her helping with the permitting. Billy, uh, <laughs> 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 we appreciate that. We need that. to help. It's a very, a very important uh, part of this process that speeds it up and time is money. Uh, we, when government does things, it costs more money than when the private sector does it, uh, just because of the uh, approach that is taken. But certainly I respect and recognize the partnership of, and, and the role that the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary plays in this. Uh, we just need to get more contributions from the state and the federal government uh, in general on, on these situations because uh, just for your own knowledge, which a lot, a lot of people don't realize, that per capita we generate more sales tax than any other county in the state of Florida. Per capita, I said, that we send $200 million a year in sales taxes to Florida and get back about 20. So we're a huge donor uh, county in dealing with these issues. And we use the area of critical state concern and the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary uh, quite often in making our case as to why uh, we need federal and state dollars to deal with these water quality issues. All right, it's time for lunch. Uh, we get back, anybody that wants to make a public comment, uh, be sure to fill out your public comment form and get it to myself or Beth, who usually sits right here, and we'll uh, take care of public comment when we get back. And we have a pending motion that was uh, that we wanted to act on, but we don't have time right now. Uh, if you want to modify it any based on John's input, I would suggest you talk about it at lunch, and we'll deal with that right afterwards. We do want to get out of here at 2.30. Uh, we have something else going on at 3, and we don't want our freezing cakes to get cold. <laughs> so, um, great for lunch, or hour, and we'll talk to you at 1.30. Yeah, we'll let you know. Yeah, we'll let you know. Yeah, we'll let you know. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, we got three, three uh, people signed up for public comment. Um, one of them, I don't see Ron Cole here. I see him hiding anywhere. I see him. We'll turn that one. The next one on the list is Russ Dunn. Russ, I saw you here. He just left. Okay. I was going to speak on the resolution. Okay. Uh, yeah, the problem with the resolution is it's still at lunch. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> oh, no, I could just wait. <laughs> okay, that's fine. We'll go ahead and start discussing it. I know there was a modification. I think there's a policy piece here. So, Caroline here, give it. There's a new version. And I've had to do with the new version. I know that. All right. So, I guess we're waiting on that. The new version is on its way. It's actually a. Uh, <laughs> You want to, we, we tweaked it a little bit at lunch. Sorry. We can, we can switch to the next All right, let's get to the next item and, and wait, because I remember there was some discussion at lunch and some changes in the vision that I'd like to put out be included. So uh, the next item on the agenda is a uh, more important thing. Is that right? So we can handle that right now. Yeah. So, um, so the, next, the next agenda item is it had to gather sports the National Marine Sanctuary 2016 buoy campaign. This was something I, I mentioned uh, at the uh, at the last advisory council meeting. Um, it's really tied to uh, our 25th anniversary and kind of how we're looking at the next year as really a celebration of the 25th anniversary. We had our uh, very successful uh, uh, 
uh, family fun day at the Islander, and, and the folks were there at the, the dinner the night before. I think it went very well. Um, I'll I'll talk a little bit more about the more doing campaign, but first I kind of wanted to turn turn the mic and, and uh, presentation over to Andy to talk a little bit about some of the promotion activities that he has been doing for the 25th anniversary, and, and then I'll wrap up with kind of what you all can expect to see coming up. Uh, with the more buoy, uh, with, with the buoy campaign itself, uh, so the coordination and help that we can do to it. So, uh, turn one of the lights off and hopefully we we'll get that projector. On. <laughs> hopefully, We're a little out of order. Shoot <laughs> the laser pointer. I can just do like this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Speaking the mic. Am I great? If you're a cat. Yeah. <laughs> Are we having issues here? No, I had put it on standby because oh. we were going to do something else and okay. it takes a little while to get back up. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and uh, while we're waiting for the projector, well, there we go. It's yeah, 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 look at that. different. Now you got to put it on a different uh, projector. There we go. Okay, it'll warm up here. It'll get a little brighter here shortly. So, um, for those of you that don't know me, um, I do public relations for the Tourist Development Council. We marked our 35th year at the end of uh, September. So, um, the um, and, and also mainly I wanted to be able to demonstrate to you guys that the Tourist Development Council values the Florida Keys National Sanctuary. Um, it values it in its advertising. It values it in its public relations programming. Um, and it also has, has contributed um, financial resources. Much of that Florida Keys Eco Discovery Center was funded from the Tourist Development Council. The Spiegel Road to Vandenberg received TDC funding. And there's a lot of other capital and infra infra infrastructure projects throughout the Keys as well. Um, for, our, um, for our TDC public relations plan for October, beginning October 1st, um, 2015 through September 30th, 2016. One of our goals uh, was indeed uh, trying to uh, bolster awareness of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and its 25th anniversary. And uh, I'm just going to take you through six, seven minutes here of some of the highlights of, uh, of what we did, but what we're still doing, by the way. For instance, uh, we just completed a, a press trip a couple of weeks ago with some key travel journalists um, to, to create awareness not only for the anniversary of the sanctuary, but also for um, the centennial celebration coming up for the two national parks. Um, and the, it's actually, it's a centennial anniversary of the National Park Service. So um, first of all, I sent you guys uh, a while ago a PDF. This is our Keys Traveler magazine. It's a print publication that we do on an annual basis that's used uh, by our sales department. And uh, as you can see, the Keys uh, Sanctuary 25 Years of Marine Preservation is our lead story. And I've got a couple of hard copies right over there on the counter by the water if you guys want to do it. Just, we, we devoted four pages uh, to the sanctuary covering everything from diving to fishing, dolphin watching, coral restoration. And uh, it's a really good piece that we actually had Candy Clark, um, former uh, reporter for the Miami Herald and avid scuba diver, do for us. Um, it's also been translated, and this is what uh, this is how this is the German translation for um, 25 years of uh, Keys Marine Protection. So, okay, come on. Did a lot with social media. And uh, primarily, um, and we're just showing you the, the uh, Facebook entries, but uh, we produced a special one minute video, actually, one minute and 10 seconds that we're going to show you. I'm going to make sure. Uh oh. We lost our Bluetooth. Hang on one second, here, guys. The Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is celebrating 25 years of protecting Keys waters and the continental United States' only living coral barrier reef.
join this celebration by immersing yourself in the key's vibrant underwater world. Or experience the thrill of catch and release sport fishing in sanctuary waters. Paddleboard, kite surf, kayak, or just relax by enjoying the sun in turquoise waters. You can even get back to the sanctuary by being a citizen scientist and helping plant corals to create new habitats. The Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, protecting marine resources for future generations. Nice little one minute social media. Um, 125,000 people reached just on the Keys Facebook page alone. Okay, or so. So, very, very, very nice uh, re re return from that. And again, this is something that, that the TDC produced. Um, to share the uh, message of the uh, sanctuary's 25th anniversary. Did a little more than that. We actually got the video out there and uh, and and pushed it to visit forward and encouraged them to use it in their social media resources and just on their Facebook page. Uh, about eight about 80,000 individuals reached there too. We then um, decided to take the uh, I call it the sanctuary anniversary birthday week post. And we took seven days, and uh, on the Keys Facebook page and other social media resources, we took different topics. Okay, this is just the, 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 this was the first on Monday, November 16th, just to sort of mark the, uh, the just a general message there. Um, as we move on here, second uh, the second uh, messaging um, talks a little bit more about the protection and what gave, gave some fast facts about protections and the. 2,900 square miles of protection and more than 6,000 species of uh, marine life. Talk a little bit about um, some of the resources, shipwrecks, archaeological treasures, extensive seagrass beds, and many <laughs> fringe islands. We haven't forgotten about this. <laughs> or so. And then um, actually we also wanted to talk a little bit about being responsible and conservation and so uh, mooring, uh, mooring buoys. Again, Florida Key Sanctuary Factoid. <clears throat> Just a nice little recreational category. This, by the way, of all the of all the seven, this got the most amount of uh, attention. About eighty-eight thousand, almost eighty-nine thousand people reached on that uh, particular post. And then uh, we wanted to focus on the cultural resources as well, and one more. Uh, one more message about the protection with the uh, coastal cleanup. Okay, and continuing, we have a uh, part, we have a website uh, that uh, that gets done called Keys Voices. It's a it's a blogging site, and we took the one of the the week of the 16th and focused on the uh, Fort Keys Sanctuary Sanctuary's 25th birthday. Okay, we took our um, video and um, decided. I said, you know, I said, you know, I think we can get some broadcast media coverage, mainstream broadcast media coverage, and uh, so we we took the video that uh, that you saw earlier, cut it up a little bit, grabbed a little a couple of interviews, and created a news package out of it, and we're just, we're going to show you two hits from that. Today marks the 25-year anniversary of the creation of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. It is a federally designated area protecting nearly 3,000 nautical miles of water that surround the Florida Keys and the island chain. The preserve features an ecosystem with shallow seagrass beds, mangrove fringed islands, and the world's third largest barrier coral reef. And it's the only one on the continent in the United States that collectively supports more than 6,000 species. So not only is it beautiful, but it does some pretty great things for our economy. The protection that the National Marine Sanctuary offers to the Florida Keys is paramount to us surviving. We're the fishing capital of the world. We have so many activities that someone needs to be here and, and keep a pulse on the health of those resources while the public continues to use and enjoy those resources. The Marine Sanctuary is also a final resting spot of some culturally important shipwrecks that go back, some of them, centuries. Yes, we are so lucky to live so close to such a beautiful place. There's a lot there to go out and discover. Yes. 
and even, even in Alaska. When we come back, a reprieve from the cold. A celebration in a tropical marine sanctuary off of Florida's coast. That story just ahead. Finally tonight on the late edition, tomorrow marks the 25th anniversary of the creation of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Now the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary of Protection Act was signed by President George H.W. Bush on November 16, 1990. It's a federally designated area protecting about 2,900 nautical miles of waters that surround the Florida Keys Island chain. It also protects the continental U.S.'s only living coral barrier reef, which is the third largest in the world and home to over 6,000 species. The sanctuary was enacted after three large freighters ran ground over the reef just 17 days apart. Some Florida Keys residents say they don't like the concept of the federal government regulating their waters, but others say it's necessary to protect a critical part of the area's tourism-based economy, economy which I would like to be contributing to because yeah. it looks really beautiful. I like that. <laughs> um, they, they, unfortunately, they they got a little line there about the um, about um, some the some Florida Keys uh, residents not wanting the sanctuary. That was something that we put in a, the original press release back 25 years ago, when the sanctuary was being you know was being debated and, and, and enacted. But it's okay. But I'll, I'll take it. Anyway. Look for Alaska. That's the way it is. That's right. <laughs> You're probably right about that. Or so. Um, also, some some uh, web web news coverage as as well. And uh, so, just take a look at some of the results. Um, the, the the television hit about 60 different markets around the country. Total of about 1.04 million viewers. Um, taking a look at. Um, just the social media that we could track, about 400,000 people reached. It's much more than that. I, I know it's more than one and a half million uh, beyond that. So nice, nice effort. Glad to be a part of it. And uh, your Tourist Development Council really does not only respect, but uses that sanctuary as much as you possibly can. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, that, was, that was fantastic work. It was it was uh, it was also awesome just to watch it unfold as, as uh, stuff kind of came out day after day. I, I can't thank Andy, uh, the Tourism Development Council, and the people who are doing that hard work uh, enough for that. Uh, pretty incredible. Um, and and it, you know, like I said, we we to kind of continue. The, the the big event was obviously the the, the date, November sixteenth, but. Um, like I said, we're, we're going to kind of keep this rolling through the next year uh, with our boring movie campaign. And uh, what you see up on the uh, up on the screen right now is um, it, uh, we we have uh, several accounts with our National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, uh, coral accounts, uh, uh, movie accounts. But um, we're, at the request of one of um, uh, one of our Blue Star operators, Fury Water Sports. Uh, they really came to us and said, you know, we want to really start a, a formal big campaign as part of the 25th um, and uh, use it to really bring in all the people that, that are commercially uh, and, and, and then, um, you know, maybe personally using um, the, the morning moves because, it, it, you know, it is, uh, it, it's a big part of what we do um, and it's, as resources get tight, uh, there are concerns. And we have concerns about um, you know, the ability to you know make sure those boring movies are out there, uh, installed correctly, uh, maintained correctly, and, and we're able to respond when when they go missing and, and, and do the best maintenance as possible to make sure they don't go missing. So, uh, so that was kind of our idea to, to start up uh, and really, really, uh, you know, really put a big push behind this type of a fundraiser. So we're going to be. Um, you're gonna you're gonna see more about this as we start to push this out, and you know I, I'd like to involve all of the advisory council members and um, to kind of use your connections throughout the keys uh, to to kind of bring awareness to this campaign, what it means to us, and and, and really what it means to the Morning Movie team itself because uh, they they need some help. And as, like I said, as, as well, who knows if Congress is going to pass a budget this Friday, but you know, it's, it's, when they do, we, we know, we, you know, we, we definitely, this is one area uh, that's, you know, I, I would say it's pretty forward facing. It's, 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 it's something we do that gets used every day by the public 
as well as commercial operators, and, and uh, it's something we want to push forward, uh, you know, into the future. So, uh, in 2016, expect to see a lot about this, and, and I really want to thank Fury right off the bat for for uh, for uh, kickstarting this with us, and um, it's going to be a, 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 a very active campaign, but also, you know, th th I know they're going to be reaching out to their colleagues, major operators, to, to make sure that um, they are aware of it, and, and in, in the words of, uh, you know, I'll say one of their owners, you know, everyone needs to pitch in their fair share uh, for, the, for the use of these things, because everyone's out, out there using them. So that's, we're going to kick this off, you know, kick it off, and, and uh, hope everyone can kind of be a part of this as we get the word out over the next in 2016. So, again, and this, uh, we'll have links, I don't, I don't know, Rachel, we have links set up quite yet on our website, but you can go to the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation's website, um, uh, nmsfocean.org forward slash Warren Boots, and, and you can see the campaign, and uh, we'll, we'll have recognition up there for, for folks who are, for, uh, for, the, for their donations, and, and uh, we'll see where this goes. Any, any questions about that? Yeah, it was still too missing in Coffin's bat. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> you can log me too. I'll go out and put them back there. Yeah. Um, for folks who, where there are boring movies uh, that missing, there is a spot now on our website where you know, just call it in and we let our boring movie team know. Dave. How much are you looking to raise? Um, our, our target for this um, in, in our discussions was $100,000. Um, you know, if, if you, uh, the, the total cost of our Morning Moon program, program annually, you know, it's, it's probably in the range of eight to $900,000 a year. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not like it's the entire program, but we wanted to, you know, kind of shoot, shoot pretty big and, and see, where, see where this goes. Uh, but yeah, our goal is $100,000. All right. The gang is back. The gang of six. There's a new motion. <laughs> so uh, we want to circle back and talk about the motion that there's a revised version, I believe, of the motion that was circulated. Chris, are we ready on that? Or? <coughs> We had QP up to, to present this because uh, he's the South Pole Restoration seat holder, but he didn't get the memo, so it wasn't at lunch <laughs> to talk about it. So what we did was uh, this um, this uh, resolution, which really Caroline uh, McLaughlin developed and bounced off um, a number of interested SAC members before then. I guess Ken, you bounced it off the entire SAC in your email. Um, we're not not really proposing any uh, changes to the substance of it. So the wherefore, whereas and the wherefores are the same, um, but uh, we would like to add one therefore, which is uh, let me, let me uh, read it out here and see if we can tweak it as necessary. So just adding. So it would be. A, at the very end of the therefore, after the, the final <clears throat> sentence, and then the new sentence, um, National Park Service and other relevant entities should experiment with active interventions that facilitate ecosystem recovery, including seagrass restoration, sponge restoration, and this is where I'm struggling, maybe John or somebody else can help here, and biochemical. Um, Inventions, or Jim Corcoran, what do we call these? Uh, Biogeochemical. Biogeochemical interventions. Period. You got that, Can you read it again, please? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> just bring it up. Yeah, just bring it to me or take a picture of it and then like, do it. Uh, yeah, I think that's what I'm going to do. 
There's no way of giving away this. Is, is there any discussion on the stuff that has already been up there that uh, was distributed earlier? Any kind of concerns? Yes. Any uh, wordsmithing? We send it out a week in advance, usually just to give everybody an opportunity to do that and encourage you to do it. But, Sometimes you come to a meeting and the juices get flowing and you decide you know, we have an inspiration. So this is your time to weigh in on that or have a comment on it. Um, we do want to have a discussion on it and we'll take any public comment related to that particular position of registration. Any other comments? Discussion? Any other comments? Sorry, Pete. Um, well, I did. Sorry. <laughs> John, this is going to be directed to you. I think you know, one of the major points of this was, well, towards the end of this was requesting that the water management district attend a meeting. I mean, was the main point of this for Sean to request the invitation from the district to attend one of our meetings? I think we should probably clear that up because okay. is that wording good, good for you? Yeah. Um, work on for the agenda for the next meeting. Is that something that you think is suitable for an upcoming meeting? Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That, that wouldn't be a problem. Uh, okay. We were focused on this one for kind of, you know, what kind of ways was the floor day, so we kind of shifted a couple of things around in February, so there'd be no problem bringing in, uh, putting the invitation out, I think, for it. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm sure we'll be happy to do that. Yeah. We can get uh, we can also get the information out if folks want to attend the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force meetings, uh, as well as working groups and the science committee meetings that uh, uh, Chris attends all the time. Get that information. Did you have something? Yeah, I just want to bring up what we we're discussing I'm not just thinking about this on the way down from Ida Mirai is perhaps it's time to start rethinking uh, reestablishing the uh, ecosystem restoration working group uh, that for many years kind of led these efforts with South Bay restoration uh, for the SAC uh, while we're having this event um, in Florida Bay, I just think it might be a good idea to at least think about reestablishing that, keeping the SAC and the, uh, the sanctuary staff uh, aware of any changes that might be going on in Florida Bay as things progress, good, bad, or different. Any comments about that? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Jerry, could you repeat what you were? Yeah, for years we had an ecosystem restoration working group that focused on the restoration of Everglades National Park and the effect on the sanctuary. Uh, I chaired that committee probably for four or five years uh, as things transitioned and Florida Bay seemed to get better in the <coughs> Sanctuary Advisory Council focused more on management plans. Um, we decided, and I agreed, that those working groups should be uh, set aside. Well, with this event going on, as far as seagrass dive in Florida Bay, I think it'd be a good idea to inform the SAC on a regular basis as to what's going on with Everglades Restoration, Florida Bay seagrass dive off, potentially the potential of repercussions from that, uh, and what can be done and what will be done to correct this measure going forward. Have a comment? Well, Jerry, were you asking if we add that to this resolution? No, 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 separate. No, it's kind of suggesting that we reform it, so it's almost a motion. Sean brought up that, that there was, we can wait on this, that's fine. Sean brought up that, that the working groups would inform the SAC going forward. I just wanted to tag on that. Really? I, I don't want to engage in. Yeah, but I do want to add to make it more uh, correct, urging state, federal, municipal, and tribal partners. Okay. That's, that's more complete of who is involved in the restoration efforts. All right, make sure that that's fine. 
And then um, take out the and. Your test is actually two layers in the language um, where in the middle of the final paragraph it says further we request that the South Florida Water Management District attend that we add to that the Corps of Engineers, which is the co co lead. Right. On Everglades restoration. That's absolutely correct. <coughs> Billy, you're not required to key West as a tribe. <laughs> well, I, I, I have That's a tribe. That's a sub-tribe. There are five tribes on the keys, and three of them are Canada West Street. Yeah, I didn't go too far in your request to see them. So. Yeah. You know, if we could run back to the, the language that we had at the beginning of this discussion, at the very, very end, um, we just read it. Therefore, uh, experiment with active interventions that facilitate the ecosystem recovery, including seagrass restoration, sponge restoration, and biogeochemical interventions for seagrass recovery, I think is specifically what we're what we're at here. John, did we capture what you were thinking about earlier? Is there something we're missing here? No, I think I, I think my, uh, my only concern was that biogeochemical might be vague enough to not remember what they were. Yeah. Or iron. Yeah. But it's really iron to sequester the sulfide in the sediment. Well, we can get that specific. Uh, we can after the last word put in parentheses, for example, iron um, dosing or whatever you call it, iron inoculation. Does anybody have heartburn about anything when you got in the post? Um, not asking for a comment. You all have your minute if you want to sign up for a comment. I did. Well, you did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay with that. Could we change, um, should experiment to, should consider active interactions? Yeah, just to, because I know the National Park Service is still yeah. talking about a lot of specific policies or the wilderness areas and things that you do in the park, and so, Without saying that they should do this experimentation, they should consider using these things. I agree. Yeah. 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 The whole point is you go to help to overcome that resistance to act. Yeah. They're considering it, but they're it's considering not to <laughs> right. overshot. Yeah, but I think without going to specifically biogeochemical interventions, I would say yeah. consider it and they should do it. And it's Personally, I don't know the specifics enough to be comfortable with I think it's kind of moot because they're going to do what they're going to do. This is us saying, think about this. Or us asking Sean to ask them to think about it. And this by no means obligates them to do anything. But you're, you're saying, she's saying, you just said the same thing to consider, think about the same thing, not to experiment with it. You know what the difference is? I mean, this says do it. You just said to think about it, and so did Carolyn. So you changed it already. No, I think I think what a resolution does in, in the context of the Sanctuary Advisory Council is just to surface an idea, um, and that's what we've done here. And, and I don't have any hope about making it considered experiment being on with. Um, but if we want to see the experiment done, then the way it's written is 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 what we need. Yeah. Is because we have to scale of this people. Right oh, okay. is, is everybody okay? <coughs> is we okay to leave it like it is? <coughs> Noting Carolyn's concern. <laughs> <laughs> and Carolyn is very intimate with the National Park Service. But, um, comments? All right. Any other edits? Susie? I don't know that it's an edit, but um, since we're making a special um, 
end in there at the end that's referring it's mainly it's going back to the seagrass die-off. I was just wondering if there might be a little spot in one of the whereases where we're specifically addressing the um, importance I, I see, you know, the, the health of Florida Bay is vital and important ecosystem. We're being specific about sponges and seagrass to add in there. It's not a really a whereas this, that mentions that. I mean, I don't know that we need that, but it, see, it would seem to me like I'd go, oh, where was the part about the, the seagrass being so crucial to this ecosystem? I got um, yeah. I, I can change that really quick. I got one. Okay. I don't know. One, two, three, four, fifth. Whereas Florida Bay is a vitally important seagrass based ecosystem. Is that fair to say? It is the heart of the bay. It's ecosystem, right? Seagrass. Seagrass based ecosystem. That take care of what you were concerned about? I think if we don't come up with something right now, then. <laughs> well, I mean, just to mention that, then we don't have. Yeah, that would be enough. All right. Any other comments? One more. Sure. Chris, go ahead. A little bird. There's a there's an opportunity to add to add whereas that cues up the addition that came at the end of this, which is whereas um, existing technologies and potential technologies exist that could uh, actively facilitate ecosystem restoration of seagrass. Seagrass ecosystem restoration. Restoration and river. Could contribute to active seagrass restoration. Existing, formerly existing, is making secret. I'd like to see the change to currently existing, future existing, formerly existing, potentially existing. So, I think I'm going to recover after that. I think I'm very funny. I know. <laughs> Restoration and recovery are kind of the same thing. Uh, if you had maintenance and or somewhere in there to Mentioned that it's a continuing concern and that we want to maintain it uh, in a good condition. You're not on a mic. Oh, that's right. You guys say the whole thing over the <laughs> About seamless maintenance, restoration, and so I just disagree with you. Yeah, Ken, I think that would be fine. <laughs> okay. Maintenance, <laughs> seagrass, maintenance, restoration, and recovery. Never mind. <laughs> if, you, if you drop a correction, I was going to disagree with Any other comments? Do I hear a motion? I guess that was the motion, right? Do I hear a second on that? Dave, make the second. Any other comments? Okay, now we're going to take some public comments. I know that Bill Wickers wants to say something. Ron, is this what you wanted to talk about? Okay, so we'll let Bill go first and then Ron. Three minutes and then we're going to call him. <coughs> Ron, if you can kind of make your way up here, that would help. Thanks.
Hello. Uh, my name is Bill Wickers. I'm here representing the Key West Charter Boat Association. And uh, uh, I'll just go ahead and read this to you. The Key West Charter Boat Association strongly endorses the Florida Keys <coughs> National Marine Sanctuary's resolution on Everglades National Park and Florida Bay. This is an extremely positive action. Our association has always supported any action that could have a positive impact in cleaning up our waters. We believe this is the key water quality to saving the unique marine waters of the Florida Keys that are so important to our livelihoods and to our quality of life. Getting the water quality back to historic levels will solve most of the problems that we see in our airshore waters and our offshore reefs. It is difficult for us to understand why we are still dealing with the same issues that occurred back in the 1990s. Hopefully, one day, we will see a resolution of this from both the state and the federal governments. The Charter Boat Association would like to feel like partners with the Sanctuary Advisory Council and protecting this beautiful place we call home. We make our livelihood in this beautiful place. The last thing we would ever want to do is see it destroyed. Thank you for listening, Captain Bill Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> Ron? Hi, uh, my name is Ron Cole, and I'm just a local citizen here, and I've, I've been uh, sort of following the uh, politically incorrect topic of climate engineering for quite some time. So I have a little bit of a concern over this putting into this geo, what was the, uh, uh, geo bioengineering. Bio bio uh, we know that uh, climate engineering is, is taking place. Uh, Russ Dunn said earlier that we need scientifically sound and trusted uh, information, ecological information. Uh, the elephant in the room here that uh, is climate engineering. Everybody's sort of dancing around it, not talking about it. We know that they've been putting aerosols into our environment, uh, aluminum, magnesium, barium, all kinds of uh, uh, aerosols that ultimately wind up in our waters. Keith and Schnarrs told us about this at a Monroe County Commission meeting uh, about three or four years ago. And uh, nobody's talking about this. Uh, you know, I have to, I have to know that this is having some kind of an effect uh, on our environment. We know that the, that the rainfall is being manipulated. Uh, this, this is a whole huge issue here, and we're not being honest about this issue. And uh, I understand that a lot of people are under restrictions. They can't talk about it and whatever, but it's uh, hopefully behind the scenes you're talking about it, and we've got to find out a way to address it and end it because ultimately uh, it's doing more damage to us than I think, than they claim it's fixing. Uh, I read the Key West Citizen every day. They must have known I was coming down here. One of the citizen voice comments that says, so which story is true? That seagrass die-off was grossly overestimated or that the eco nuts think that the sky is falling? That must be me they're talking about. Thank you, Robert. Any, um, any other comment from the SAC before we take a vote? Yeah, just uh, maybe in light of that, somebody who would maybe uh, define what they were using as that bio-geo... Bio-geochemical. Chemical intervention. There, there was a suggestion. Uh, uh, Jim, Jim, get a microphone so you can have some discussion. Uh, I heard a suggestion from back in the room that parenthetically, after biogeochemical interventions, you could add, for example, uh, iron treatment for sulfide toxicity. And, and that, that leads a very specific suggestion of an experiment to do to stop CBS lab. 
Did that answer your question, Dave? Okay. Just so it's not misunderstood, because everybody could interpret that a lot of ways. So Chris and Dave, are you okay with that? Dave, you okay with that? Thank you. Yes. You're good. Okay. Any other comments? One more. Carolyn. And I'm still a little uncomfortable with the wording, just suggesting that we should do experiments on this type of technology in wilderness areas. I mean, again, I don't know enough about the technology to know if it's established technology, it's worked in other places, but again, to suggest that they should do these experiments in areas that are designated as wilderness makes me a little uncomfortable with the language as it's written. Yeah. Yeah. So the place where the seagrass die off and the sulfur toxicity, sulfide toxicity is happening is in, in Florida Bay, in, in the designated buildings. In my opinion, what I know, what little I know about this, maybe Jim, you need to expand, but we're talking about introducing iron. Uh, not, we're not talking about rebar or something, but I assume filing, the iron filings or something, or compounds, uh, in order to see if you can um, you know, short circuit this toxicity, jumpstart seagrass uh, recovery, and so on. Jim, I'll let you take it away, but I think it's pretty innocuous, especially if it's done in an experimental way, which seems like the only practical way to begin something like this. Well, actually, because I think I'm hearing a different point. I'm hearing that we don't want to encourage them to experiment. We want them to encourage. We, we want to encourage them to try these things or to to, to use them, right? Like, oh, by um, Without giving you an entire bite of geochemistry course, for, for your point, the reason that seagrasses are dying um, in this condition is because sulfide is being produced, but there's no way to detoxify it. If we were in Georgia, this amount of sulfide production wouldn't kill seagrass because the iron in the sediment would complex it and it would turn it into pyrite, which is not toxic. We've done experiments over the years that we, we can uh, artificially kill seagrass by encouraging sulfate reducers by putting organic matter in the soil, and then if you also put iron, liquid iron, in the soil at the same time, that saves those seagrasses from dying. So we've proposed to the park that right now we know that the system recovers because individual shoots survive widely spaced 20, 30 meters apart. We, we suggested that they may be able to um, preserve large 10 meter by 10 meter patches by fertilizing those patches with iron to complex the sulfides, and that would greatly enhance the, the time it takes to recover. So, I, you definitely don't want all that information. <laughs> Has that technology, per se, been applied anywhere? We've done experimentally in Florida. You have? Yes. And is, is there like peer reviewed documents? Uh, peer reviewed papers, yes. I'm sorry, did, did it work? Is that Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. But, uh, no, but it was very good. Had done it on this, this kind of large scale, that would be So we've already experimented. We could now it. it would be appropriate to ask. I think so. Yeah, I think the, the purpose is for restoration or at least for recovery or remediation so that the dial doesn't proceed to a greater extent. The use of experiment um, is that that hasn't been done in wilderness and that is a consideration. And that the scale of this, that's a large scale experiment. You can do it across the whole range at the moment. So, um, yes, it would be done at least initially in an experimental in an experimental way. And but the purpose to see whether that was a viable way to um, interrupt the expansion of dying seabird. Um, how the park uh, resolves that with the wilderness issue and the permanent, et cetera, is still to be determined. Uh, we did receive a 
pre-proposal pre -proposal regime and it's been re reviewed um, and responded to uh, conceptually favorably, but um, with refinement to the proposal and, and then further considerations that have to be made. All right. Any further discussion? No further revision. All right. Um, one more comment. Okay. One more comment. And it goes back to the interjection of the word maintenance, um, which to me is that context seems more of a, an engineering uh, action. I don't know how you, how I would maintain seagrass meadow. It's a natural thing for it to sustain itself. And so maintenance of that is so. So I thought the first, just the other two words were not to cover the purpose of, of the uh, Resolution. Yeah. Well, let me explain a little bit further about why I wanted that in there. And uh, it, the terms of recovery and, and restoration are, are essentially temporary in, in that. Uh, once you've done the job, then, you, then you're finished with it. And what I wanted to do was to try to put into, into the verbiage something that would uh, indicate that we wanted to maintain it or, or, or to keep it in a healthy condition. And uh, that it would be an ongoing process in which you would, you would uh, keep aware of it and monitor it and work with it. And, and not suddenly discover, oh, gee, it's it's going downhill. We've got to do something. So I make, maintenance was the word that came to my mind to convey that particular concept. Uh, and I, I think it's important to have it in there uh, if if you want to use a different term to accomplish that. You know, that's fine. How about conservation? Conservation, restoration, recovery. I agree. Sustainability, like sustainability, I see the word maintenance in the word restoration, but like it's not actually going up. It's because of restoration, but restoration, which is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what I just wrote down. And the restoration programs or action is still on the way. The, the maintenance is in the wrong place. It should be at the end. They make the score. And I, but I, I won't object for to it being. No, I, I, I know what you're saying. I, I agree there is an opportunity. Correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but don't you represent the audience this is intended for? Yeah. So if he understands what's meant without it being in there, and it might be misunderstood if it's there, why leave maintenance in there? Just a thought. I would call it conservation. I agree with Chris. Kick me in the house, replace with conservation. Let's call it a little bit. I accept that. You okay with that, Chris? Skip, can you go with that? Yeah. All right. Just, just wanted to get that. That's the ready? Ready. All right, let's call it a little bit. Clinton Barrett. Chris Berg. Yes. Justin Bruin. Yes. Jack Curlett. Yes. Ben Daughtry. Yes. David Vandenbosch. Yes. Mimi uh, Will Benson. Yes. Mimi Stafford. Yes. John B. Page. Yes. Stephen Leopold. Yes. Keith Brezza. Yes. David Mickey. 
Absolutely. Corey Malcolm? Yes. Rob Mitchell? Yes. Martin Moe? Yes. Ken Niedemeyer? Yes. George Nugent? Yes. Andy Newman? Affirmatives. Ken Rita? Yes. David Vaughn? Yes. The agency reports. Let's get through this so if you can keep it succinct. That would be great. Let's start with the superintendent and whether the assistant superintendent. <laughs> 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 um, uh, I, I, I didn't have much to uh, add here. Um, we, we covered a lot of other topics today. Um, Kind of talked about the 25th anniversary, that's what we're going to be looking at here. Um, in terms of our uh, management plan uh, update and review, the look at the zones and the regulations, um, we, we continue to work on that draft environmental impact statement, working on some of the modeling um, that you saw at the, the last uh, at the last meeting. Uh, so we're looking to try to get that drafted up here uh, through the winter time, and, and that goes into the review process so uh, that's it, it, you know, our, our goal is, is uh, late spring is probably summer you know in terms of the release of the, of the draft EIS um, and uh, just kind of keep you updated along the way um, one one thing that, uh, one thing uh, kind of a personnel change uh, our director uh, Dan Boxer retired on November 1st uh, and so uh, uh, John Armour who, so we have met and uh, currently acting director and continuing that acting director role until uh, a, until that recruitment has gone forward. Uh, that recruitment's taken a little while, so it will probably be well into next year before that position is filled with the director. But we'll continue with John as, as the acting director and uh, Matt Brookhart, who ran the policy uh, branch for uh, the Office of National Resanctuaries, is in the role of that acting deputy director. So there's kind of a high level of uh, leadership at this time. Um, for, for folks, uh, John was down here for our 25th anniversary event. Um, he's very familiar with the Florida Keys and joined us down here. Uh, former DEP uh, employee, and so uh, he, he was certainly familiar with Florida Keys issues. So like, we've got a, a good person there to kind of look out for us at the top level. Um, that's really all I have for us uh, right now. So, um, for the regional report. Okay, uh, good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, let's see, can I get up here? Or yeah, let me, come on up. Let me, uh, I'll grab a move. I, I move around a lot. Okay, yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary. And, yeah, thank you. I, I'm going to try to go through this pretty quickly, but uh, you know at the last meeting uh, we briefed you all on some progress that we've been making with the Cubans as far as uh, a sister sanctuary network uh, memorandum of understanding. And uh, uh, we actually moved light, light speed after that briefing. And we were already prone to, but we didn't know if it would happen, but, but sure enough uh, we have established now an agreement with uh, Cuba. Let me. Um, this is, uh, we went down to Cuba, uh, actually we were attending the tri-national meeting that is co-hosted by uh, several academic organizations. Uh, Mo Marine Laboratory has been one of the standards there for all the meetings. Uh, Heart Research Institute from Texas, um, Environmental Defense Fund, the Ocean Foundation. Um, so we were already in Cuba, some of us, for that meeting as well as a, a, a very large scientific meeting that, that Cuba holds every uh, three years, the Marcuba uh, conference. But this is uh, the day. Uh, this is Dr. Catherine Sullivan, uh, along with uh, uh, Dr. Fernando uh, uh, Bermudez, uh, uh, who is there currently signing in, in this. They're signing the uh, uh, memorandum of, of understanding. This is a, a very significant. We didn't understand the significance of this until really it, uh, while it was taking place. We were in the Ministry of uh, uh, Foreign, uh, the, uh, Foreign Ministry's office, and their, their complex, and you can see uh, uh, Pedro Ramos was there to sign for the National Park Service. This is John Armour, 
This is the uh, this is Holly uh, uh, Bamford, who is our currently our number two in NOAA. Uh, at, uh, she was a head of the National Ocean Service. This is uh, Jeffrey. Uh, uh, well, he's the uh, U.S. ambassador to Cuba, and. Uh, then over here on the other side of the room, you see uh, some of the uh, Cuban delegation. Dr. Catherine Sullivan, of course, is the administrator for NOAA, and uh, uh, she was there as the principal uh, for us. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of attention. There's over uh, 2,000 original uh, press pe uh, articles that came out, and so it was a very uh, heavily attended by media. Um, from all over the world, from just about every country you can imagine. And there was a great deal of interest in, in, in the signing. And the significance of it is that it was the first agreement between the U.S. and Cuba of any sort, but particularly environmental agreement, uh, in 60 years. And so this was uh, a major step forward in, in working with Cuba. And, and let me, uh, again, this is uh, uh, Elizabeth McClanahan, who is head of our internet, or She's now the deputy of our international affairs for NOAA. Bill Keeney, that's on my regional team. Pedro, uh, Dr. Hernandez, uh, Dr. Sullivan, uh, the ambassador to Cuba. Uh, Maritza Garcia Garcia, she's been the person that I've worked with for five years uh, <coughs> under the radar to, to get this through. Uh, very far under the radar to get this through. And then uh, John Armour, our acting director. Uh, so uh, uh, again, we are all very proud of what uh, what we accomplished. Uh, this is just a quick, short video of the signing. But the Cuban, the, the people, uh, everyone was just so excited about this this uh, the demonstration. But uh, I, I, I was talking to Maritza just a quick while they're signing here. I was telling her one day. I said, "Did you know, Dr. Sullivan was the first lady to walk in space." In, in 1984, and Maritza very sweetly looked at me and she said, the first U.S. lady. Um, <laughs> the year before, a Russian astronaut beat it to it. But uh, I, I thought that was pretty humor. She has a good sense of humor. I remind her of her father, so we get along beautifully. Um, but uh, Dr. Sullivan, uh, she gave a very moving uh, presentation here. I think uh, it was very heartfelt, as did the Cubans. And it, it, what this does is establishes a sister sanctuary network of marine protected areas between Cuba and uh, uh, the U.S. Specifically, uh, we were looking at uh, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and the Guanacabibis National Park, was, which is down in the southwestern corner of Cuba. And then offshore from there is an area called Banco de San Antonio, and we're sistering that one up with the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. The reason is that both of them, have, uh, the Cubans have a, a keen interest in oil and gas development uh, around Banco de San Antonio, and they want to know how we've managed that uh, in uh, the U.S. And so that's one of the things that we're going to be doing. They're interested in uh, setting up some expeditions and cruises that we're already working on with partners here in the U.S., and uh, we're going to be developing a, a work plan that we're going to be trying to get out in, in the next uh, four months. And uh, let me go to this this last. Whoop, 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 whoop too far. Oh, oh there, right there. Uh, again, just to show you, there's a there's a uh, Banco de San Antonio. You can see it over here in this. In, I mean, uh, Guanacabibas over over in this corner, or right there. And then here, you can see a blow up of it. It is a biosphere reserve, a national park and biosphere reserve. And then this is the Banco de San Antonio. Uh, just some general uh, points that came out in, uh, that are contained in the Memorandum of Understanding. It's a cooperation in the conservation and management of marine protected areas. Uh, the Cubans have done an extremely good job of protecting their resources. They have over 25% of their coast is already established under marine protected area uh, conservation and management. Uh, it establishes a, a cooperative relationship to facilitate joint efforts. Uh, you can read this for yourself, but I think what, what you're going to see here is there's, there's going to be a, a great deal of exchanging information, best practices, and experiences regarding marine protected areas. 
There's going to be um, uh, common guidelines. We're going to be looking at what they're doing to protect their resources and how we're going about uh, protecting ours. Um, and again, they're very interested in some of the things we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Water quality is one of their big concerns. It's a, it's a keen concern, and they're upstream of us, so whatever we can do to jointly address water quality. But they're somewhat ahead of us in that they've uh, been using organic uh, fertilizer. They haven't used phosphates or nit nitrogen because they haven't been able to afford it for decades. So, uh, and we're going to develop a complementary uh, activities related to research and monitoring, education, outreach and education, enforcement methods, and uh, performance assessments and community involvement. Um, this is a big one, and, and to be interesting enough, this is something that's keen to them. I'm talking about the advisory council process, and they're very keen to learn more about it. Uh, we plan to be doing joint publications and collaborative research and, and management on, on into the future. What we can't do is promise money. We can't exchange money. We have to operate within the president's executive powers. Um, we cannot uh, violate the embargo. And, uh, but there's a lot that we can do within the president's executive powers to continue a relationship. An interesting point, it just sort of uh, it, it, it makes me we grin every time they say it. They don't call it uh, the embargo. They, they call it, uh, they call it uh, the, the uh, Blockade. <laughs> and you know we had a blockade in the 60s, but uh, they still call it the blockade instead of the embargo. But do uh, you have any questions? Yes, Chris. When I was down there, I got to tour around the sort of northern top of the um, of the Wanted to Base Park and look at the mangrove and the shallow hard bottom and all that. Looked just like just like home, more or less. And I saw a lot of lobster fishing. Uh, going on, they would, I don't remember exactly what it was doing, but they had a big kind of mothership and they would harvest the lobster, bring them back live to a, an impoundment there on the North Shore and then do whatever they did with them. But it reminded me, your, your slide there reminded me that our, many of our lobster, John, this is your thing, right? Many of our lobster larvae originated from that, um, from that part of, uh, not the North Shore? Okay. It's a uh, shame. Yeah. But point being, we share a lot of marine um, resources that originate there, lar coral, larvae, or whatever else. And hopefully we can really uh, explore that with them. And the better they take care of that, the better off we're going to be. Yeah, Chris, right around that corner there, down the bottom, is a, a classical big gyre. And there's really rich uh, lobster resources there that I've seen. <coughs> I've visited. John? Right, it's the, it's the southwest coast of the Isle of Youth, the Gulf of Batabano, or however you pronounce it. The, so it is uh, um, on the southwest coast, and that's where the gyre is. That's where the big lobster fishery is. That's where the big lobster population is. And there is genetic evidence and um, 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 individual-based lobster modeling that suggests that is one of our sources right there. Which brings up my non-question. As you move forward, please don't forget that the state of Florida would have a lot of interest, in, a lot of shared self-interests in 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 these kinds of, of partnerships. And and many of us, after you guys have been doing this inside the FWC, have been talking about those shared shared interests. And that was a good one that Chris just brought up. So don't forget about it. John, yeah, without a doubt, every time I've been down here, I've thought of you and your crew and what, what all you're working on because you've been able to demonstrate some of the some of the exchange. One thing of interest here, uh, I, I'm saying this very carefully, is that their lobster fishery is primarily supported by casita divers. I know that. <laughs> and, and they actually do a very good job. They, they remove their casitas at the end of the season, they put them back in. Um, and they, they do a, a, a good job with it. So um, that not, that's not meaning I'm changing any position, officially or unofficially. It's just, it's a, it's a fact. It's not peer reviewed though, Bruce. Um, <laughs> okay, any, any other question? I, I'm just really excited about it. I, I, get, I start talking about it and I start losing my way because uh, there's so many opportunities here. And it is, it is um, one where um, the, the 
they have a lot to share with us and we have a lot to share with them and right now we have to keep it within these certain boundaries but but we can do that thank you thank you Billy. uh turn back from dp uh, try to keep my report pretty short. So just a quick update. Um, you guys heard of the Safe for Water Quality Protection Program uh, Canal Restoration Advisory Subcommittee uh, earlier today with uh, Rhonda and just heads up that there is a meeting if anybody's interested in going to one on this Friday. Um, I have the agenda if anybody's interested in looking at it. And we can make sure that that gets passed around. Uh, last meeting I reported that we've still been tracking the unprecedented policies uh, outbreak in Miami-Dade and Barrett County. Um, we have not received a lot of reports uh, since that last meeting, but anecdotally from my staff we're still going out there. The disease is still uh, at uh, higher than normal concentrations, so oh, I'm very hopeful that that will continue to die down. Um, but please, please, as you are able and are out there, if you see disease, please make sure it's being reported into uh, down here in the uh, sanctuary to Tamira. Um, if you're up north for whatever reason, um, there's a program called CVAN, and we're really, really dependent on um, everybody who's kind of the eyes and ears on the water for us managers. Um, Upcoming meetings, just wanted to give you guys a head, kind of a continuing heads up. We've got the Our Borders Community Planning Process that is just like this process, where a group of stakeholders have engaged in management. They've learned all about the northern part of the Puerto Rico Act, and they're developing recommended management actions. They are just recommendations. There's nothing formalized there. Just to make sure that that word's out there, recommendations. Um, but they want to get more community input on those recommendations, and so in January and February, there's going to be some um, what we're calling community meetings to kind of roll out what they've drafted and to get some more additional feedback. So I'll be sending out those dates in case anybody's interested. Um, it will be roughly two meetings for uh, each of the four northern counties. Uh, and then just a heads up in the legislative world, uh, the Florida legislative session is going to be kicking up uh, as an earlier session again this year, so starting in January. Uh, and I know that there are always targeted days to go up and kind of pump up the, I know there's Florida Keys Day, I know there's Dive Day, Ocean's Day. So as you are interested and available, we'd love to have you go up and talk to Florida legislature and, and, and educate them about how important these resources are to this community. Uh, I know for sure that Ocean's Day is February 11th, but I mean, the day is that like, most I know is sponsor of uh, an event on the 10th and the actual day is the 11th. I think Dive Day is February 4th. Uh, so I just kind of wanted to put those on the right. Thanks. All right. <coughs> uh, David Dupree of WC. I have a question. All right. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. FWC has been busy with a number of violations up and down the Keys, uh, from Key West to Marathon. We don't have um, anything huge to report, but it's been consistent until the weather, of course, got nasty, and then things slowed down a great deal. Um, but prior to that, for the last few months, we've been very consistent on the bridges, a lot of illegal fishing, and I was um, interested, which kind of ties into part of what we're talking about um, with licenses and with NOAA's uh, program earlier, we're finding a lot of um, unlicensed fishermen on the bridges, um, most of them out of Hialeah, Miami. Uh, I was just speaking to somebody at lunch and we were talking about uh, fisheries courses and, and they were talking about maybe doing some down here in the Keys. I don't think we need them so much in the Keys. I would really like to encourage people to um, put on some more in Miami, uh, fisheries courses, regulations courses. So maybe we can do something there or help out with doing something there. Um, Yesterday, I don't know if this is a little bit off topic and off WC's regular mission, but everybody heard about what happened in Coral Shores yesterday. Uh, did everybody, I, I'd like to give you just a quick briefing on that if I may also, because it concerned the whole community. It's not necessarily uh, sanctuary related, but I wanted to tell you what happened. Uh, yesterday, Monroe County Sheriff's Office got a call. It was a young child had seen an individual going into Coral Shores High School. They thought they were carrying a, um, a rifle with them. That turned out not to be the case in Monroe County Sheriff's Office, FHP, FWC, all of us responded very quickly. Um, Monroe County Sheriff's Office went through and they cleared the whole building and, and found nothing. There were um, well over 
200 to 300 parents who were very concerned. Um, all of the kids were texting uh, while they're on the floor and hiding in the, in the closets and hiding in the classrooms. They're all texting their parents and they're telling them, yeah, we heard that uh, someone was shot. Yeah, we heard that, uh, that someone was arrested. Yeah, uh, and, and the teachers are saying the same thing because they're hearing it. It was a, a communications disaster on that part. Now, on, on law enforcement, we all knew nothing was happening. We all knew after we cleared the classrooms and everything, cleared the building, everything was going very well. And again, the sheriff's office did fantastic. But those kids were terrified. They, they ramped up their own fears so much through their own speculation. And a few trustworthy kids say something to some other kids speculatively and suddenly it becomes fact. Well, by the time it was over, like I said, there were 300 parents, half of them were crying, the kids were crying. They really scared themselves a lot. Um, I wanted to mention this only because this is the SAC. This is a community organization and that was a big deal in the community. Um, and I wanted to make sure you knew that the Sheriff's Office did a great job and we think we did, and along with FHP. Um, if anything like that happens again, I would strongly encourage you to talk to your kids about stuff like that uh, because it was, um, it was very scary to all of them. So yesterday was a, an exciting, unfortunate morning, but um, it was, hey, it was uh, very busy. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Sure. Uh, what's, the, what's the message that you want to really deliver here, though? Because you said talk to the talk to your kids, but what, what is the, it that... The specific message I want to talk to you about, you about is um, law enforcement knew what they were doing. Law enforcement had everything under control, but the community and the, the, the message that each of them were giving was a false message. Um, we, we see that in so many different areas. We see that in so many different social media aspects. So what I'm, what I'm encouraging you to do is when you have family, you have friends, tell them to please. If you didn't see it happening, if you didn't see a guy with a gun, don't speculate. Don't text the people that you, you heard or you, you think or you... No, 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 no. It's important to understand. If you saw somebody with a gun, then you saw somebody with a gun. Otherwise, remain calm, let the police do their job, let them do what they have to do, because it was really out of control. Parents were irate about getting to their kids, about what they thought was happening, and it, nothing was really happening. In the end, nothing happened. So again, it's just important to make sure, if you know something, say it, but if you don't know, keep it, keep it down, keep it quiet. Yes, David? Yeah, just real quick. Dovetailing, um, I have friends, obviously, I worked there for many years. I went on the Monroe County Sheriff's Office Facebook page, and I knew what was going on. Right. You know, they the were, yeah, they right. did whatever they could to be on top of the information. <laughs> so I guess the, if you wanted to send an additional message is, don't act on speculation. Whether, you know, and you can't really expect the young people not to do that, but the parents and the rest of the, the, rest of the adults can't. Do <laughs> you want to know? Monroe County uh, did a remarkable job of keeping us posted. There were, they, they updated every so often. You know, we're not finding any, everything's good, you know. And it, you're right. What was really funny, um, one of the officers who was there, um, I was telling them, look, everything's fine. I gave out all the information. And he actually came back to me and called me on my cell phone and said, well, Captain, that's not what I'm getting from these parents. They, these parents are telling me this. And I said, what? I'm telling you everything is fine. There are no weapons. There's no hostages. But that fear builds. And that fear generates panic. And that panic generates emotions. So um, it's important that we, that we keep these things in mind. This is, it was a great, great, great drill. And that's all it turned out to be. It, and, and we're going to put this to use. We're going to do some a meeting with the sheriff's office and the FHP officers are going to get together and discuss it. We have to do some PR with the families, with the schools, with the kids to let them know. If you don't see it, you're just scaring anybody by speculating on anything in a case like that. So I realize it's nothing to do with the SAC, but I wanted you to know what's going on in the community. It's there. actually a really good uh, tie into what we went through last year with uh, these maps, you know, and the misinformation that has gone out in the, this whole planning process and the backlash we've gotten. So it's really what happens, you know. <laughs> well, I can now tell you, with the recent atmosphere with law enforcement and all the stuff that's going on with law enforcement and how it's been so anti-law enforcement, that same kind of thing is happening in the media. 
people reporting what they heard, and, and the media is allowed to say, well, I heard this, or we heard this, or we think this is happening. And then people hear it and they say, oh, well, if the media said it, it's a fact. It was a, it was a great well, social to my world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. All right, let's move on. Okay. Um, John Hunt? Yeah, I'm going to start with Jim. Well, I guess in the spirit of, of general community stuff, um, for all of you that don't have anything to do either Thursday, Friday, or Saturday this coming weekend, but I've heard a rumor that there is a fantastic, a truly fantastic uh, musical going on in the Marathon Community Theater. Uh, it's a rumor because I've heard it, but there are people that can confirm maybe whether it was any good. And, uh, and I'm not advertising, I'm just in so I'm just advertising. Oh, so. be careful, he may invite you up on stage. He may. <laughs> but uh, but on, on to FWC. The, the FWC uh, management side has, over the past couple, three commission meetings, initiated early stages of um, multiple, I guess, um, management directions that relate to us in the Florida Keys. And so I wanted to give you a heads up on the workshops associated with them. First of all, we're hosting a Snook Symposium. For those of you interested in Snook, it's going to be, it's a statewide symposium. It's going to be in Orlando, and I think it's on January 10th. Might be January 9th. But I, I forgot to write it down, but you can obviously go on our website and and if you wish to attend and register. It's a um, science management stakeholder workshop. And then we have, uh, at our commission meetings, had initial discussions and draft rules and sort of combinations of different different actions on Mutton Snapper at, at the meeting in November. And the workshops are scheduled the ones here in the Keys will be February 2nd. Um, looks like it's at Hawks K Resort. February 3rd in Key West at the Marriott Beachside. And February 4th at the Murray Nelson Government Center. And I will hand this um, to the sanctuary and hopefully they'll, they'll be able to get this into to the minutes. And so, uh, the mutton snapper staff recommendation had to do with changing bag limits, changing trip limits, um, and uh, there might be a couple other things that I've forgotten about. Secondly, we're going to be having our barracuda. I've talked to you about barracuda before and what, what people recommended um, as draft rules. We'll be having our barracuda workshops on February 22nd in Key West. I don't know where, but in Key West. And February 24th in Alamorada. And then finally, uh, three years have passed since in the Marine Life Rule, we stopped um, in partnership with the Marine Life Fishermen, the uh, harvest of the uh, pink tip anemone, condylactus, and we'll be ho hosting a workshop on that topic and anemones in general on February 23rd in Key County Beach. So there's the heads up. Some of these are before the next meeting. Some of them are days after the next meeting. And I wanted you to be aware of right now. And that's it. All right, thank you. Uh, Noah Fisher, is that Thanks, Ken. So the South Atlantic Council is meeting this week in Atlantic Beach and is scheduled to approve for implementation two new actions. <coughs> One would establish commercial trip limits or trip limits in the commercial dolphin industry, and the second is to change the start date of the commercial and recreational fishing season for yellowtail snapper, and that's to minimize the likelihood of future winter closures. We expect them to approve for public hearings, draft rebuilding measures for the Florida Keys hogfish stock. Um, they're looking at really substantial reductions in catch both for the commercial and recreational sectors, as well as new size, bag, trip limit um, measures, and a fixed recreational fishing season. 
It will also approve for public carries proposed changes to natural boundaries and catch limits and also do electronic reporting requirements for the providers after. It will approve scoping measures or to go out the public scoping new catch limits and measures for mutton snappers. So we're, they're trying to coordinate those with the FWC. I think they'll be looking at similar measures there. And they pulled all of the mutton snapper measures out of that, what was previously yes. the South Florida, so there's really not much left to that. Merry Christmas, Tom. Oh, oh, oh. They'll discuss the uh, spiny lobster overage that I mentioned at our last meeting and uh, the Gulf Council's recommendation to convene a joint advisory panel meeting to talk about potential uh, recommendations for the next season. And then our NASA grouper listing determination is still pending. I reported on that like four meetings ago. It's gotten held up, but I expect that that'll be out uh, before we meet in, in February. And as Russ mentioned this morning, uh, we put out a for, for uh, comments and action plan for fish discard and release more out science. And we're still seeing comments on that through December 18th. And that's all I have. All right. Thank you, Heather. Uh, I don't see, is there anybody in North Beach and EPA National Park Service that you request? Uh, since the last meeting uh, in relation to Florida Bay, uh, I would say that uh, Everglades National Park um, briefed the regional level um, office uh, for the awareness of the situation requested assistance and uh, asked them to consider it as a uh, crisis incident. And um, that's going up the chain to uh, DC. And we've not heard anything back yet uh, in terms of the assistance, but we're keeping them informed of three things. <coughs> for financial assistance in order to uh, staff up uh, specifically for Bay, Florida Bay work. Um, we are greatly understaffed and that's already in motion, uh, bringing in new people, at least on term, short term. And then uh, also essentially um, monetary assistance, but in terms of uh, facilities and upgrades for equipment. Pete, you have a question? I did have a question for Chris. Good to you, Al. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, Chris, given that um, spotted sea trout are probably or are the most susceptible to um, harmful effects from this seagrass die-off, and given what Chris's group's data is showing, and also the reports coming from the guides, trip reports, and also krill surveys, it's very evident that spotted sea trout numbers are severely declining and have over the past few years. Just wondering if this is on the Park Service's radar and if they're considering uh, regulation changes like they have done, um, or like they did with snook in previous years when their numbers were uh, severely uh, threatened. Because I think it's certainly at that point. Uh, one of one of the one of the suggestions uh, to the regional or action items that might have to be considered is closure of certain areas um, due to further impacts if the uh, use continued, and those would be the areas that are. So we'll uh, just probably see that. Uh, so they will be, uh, I guess to answer your question, they will be protected if those measures were um, decided. Okay. Go to them. Uh, just a second. So from a fishery management perspective, just like with snook, the, the snook regulations were done by the commission when 
when the snook population is declining. Not area closures necessarily, but I would suggest that you contact our Division of Fishery Management on, on this issue. Okay. Are we shuttling again? Well, I, I just say the action wouldn't be specifically any any closure. Thank you. The closure wouldn't be specifically for a spotted sea trout. It would be for habitat and damage that continued use for um, um, what might occur. So that's the benefit. Benefit would be for the fish. I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, as far as I know, under the superintendent's companion, they have the authority to make fisheries regulations. Um, so I don't think if this is a statewide situation. Well, I'll, I'll, all I'm going to say is there's, there's usually an attempt to have a partnership at that point. Okay. And, and most certainly in the case of, of snook, when, as the, when, after the declines of, of snook, especially following, and that was the cold event, which was a broader spatial event. But as recovery occurred, it recovered at different paces and you know, size and size limits and what have you stayed longer, you know, more stronger management stayed longer inside the Everglades area than it did on the East Coast. And so that was kind of, I mean, there was that whole partnership and some of those requests did come from a part of the commission. So, I mean, it, you know, I don't, I don't know all the details, but there would probably be an attempt to have some kind of partnership just to yeah. keep those relationships going, which is why I would still say to you, not exclusively to us, but in, us in addition. Yeah. And the commission has to Yes. 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 Since the last SAC meeting, uh, the police responders of the Coast Guard, Coast Guard Auxiliary investigated 27 calls from the National Response Center in the sanctuary for uh, pollution. All of it was uh, fuel based, except one was from uh, nitric acid. The DEP assisted in monitoring that, uh, the specific levels. Um, there were uh, one case involved just uh, drums of fuel. Several of the others were derelict vessels that uh, the fuel had to be removed from them. Uh, there were five cases that were federalized, uh, and um, I guess uh, one. One of the derelict vessels was one that Mark Moe called in from the, the mangroves there. Um, and um, that one, I understand, will be uh, removed, reinvestigated and removed Thursday of this week. So uh, the Coast Guard is currently investigating uh, something that's all right now at uh, almost 53. And um, tomorrow they will be uh, finalizing that and removing the fuel. Everything's stable there now. It's been. Um, uh, boom, and uh, there's no fuel leaking right now, but uh, and it'll be cleaned up by uh, tomorrow. Don? Okay. Uh, what can you tell us about the uh, Cuban chugs in the Marquesas, if anything? They've been sitting out there for a long time. They've got fuel in them. Uh, there's more and more of them all the time. I can talk about that if you want. Okay, that'd be great. Go ahead, Phil, if you got something on also. What I've no, got. I, I just know that that's being studied and uh, there's a plan to remove those, but you may have some more current information. Yeah. All right, Coast Guard, Border Patrol, all of us met together. Uh, number one, the big problem is financing, and number two is where it's coming from. Um, FWC has been working with Border Patrol, and it seems like we've, uh, we've managed to get some funding uh, from D.C. under Border Patrol. One of the things that the state has had an issue with is the, the Cuban chugs coming to, to shore and they are removing the people from them and then the boats are sitting there. <laughs> the state has always felt it doesn't make much sense if I were in Texas and a, and a vehicle came across the border 
you'd remove both the individuals and you'd remove the vehicle. You wouldn't let it sitting in the middle of the highway. So why are you letting these boats sit here? Well, that was the logic that was used and Border Patrol seemed to understand better um, when it went, went through the, the higher chains of command. So they've come up with some funding. So I'm working with the local supervisor directly to have these uh, Cuban chubs removed. And that's, in Martin Moe's case, the, the email being sent. That's what we were waiting for in that case. Um, so now, from this point forward, I am expecting that we'll have a better um, response to many of the Cuban chubs that are coming because there is finance. FWC and or Coast Guard may still be hauling them into shore to a place where they're accessible because the Border Patrol has no vessels down here, but uh, we're more than willing to help them out. We just can't keep putting the burden on the boating improvements funds in Monroe County because they're out of money. They only have enough money to remove maybe 100 a year, and we've gotten well more than 100 TVs a year, so thank you. Thank you. Finally, I think, Ed? Um, we've just recently privatized our wastewater system at the base, so now the Aqueduct Authority <coughs> managing all of our um, wastewater, and they'll be decommissioning our wastewater treatment plant, which will take one more small plant out of service, including its shallow pressure so, that's all. all right. So any other agency reports I missed? Uh, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, Mayor Cates and I guess there's a few of your cohorts left over here. Sticking it out with us, and uh, the party's just beginning. So, uh, where's Beth? Beth, where exactly is this uh, SAC party? <laughs> so, uh, to celebrate a year of great work and to bring in the new year, we will be uh, going down the road a little bit to the Sunset Bar, Sunset Grill, and Raw Bar. And it's just this side of the seven mile bridge. You take a left 